With great pleasure, we have got Michael Maisy part two today, voted our most handsome <laughs> podcast guest, not only by my personal assistant in Alabama, but also by the comments of many of the viewers. We did have Alex Reed in here recently, maybe giving him a, a run for, what do you think, James, Alex Reed versus Michael Maisy, most handsome podcast yeah. guest? <laughs> 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 we appreciate all your comments about important social issues that we discussed. <laughs> we'll mind a threesome with Michael Maisy. <laughs> so, Michael, <laughs> it's good to see you again. Mate, it's good to How's it been since the last one? Mate, I just, I, I think, firstly, I just want to say thank you for giving me that platform to do it because off the back of it <clears throat> it opened up so many doors and opportunities for me where I've been able to go into loads of prisons in the south of England and basically carry a message of hope which you know I just think it's important that, that I say that here that that the work that you do one of the ripple effects of that is that I've been able to go in and help a lot of people so um, that's really good to hear and you're doing such important work it's a privilege to share the platform with you yeah thank you mate thank you and um yeah I've just been really busy you know since since the book release and since we done this there's been lots of prisons reached out to get me to come in I've done a lot of that stuff and it's been it's been eye-opening parts of it have been really challenging getting through all the logistics of trying to make a difference in there. Could you describe that? How, what's the logistics? How hard is it to get in? And well, what I found is, Sean, is that a lot of people who work in the prison, like prison officers and emotional well-being people and people who, who put on courses, they want people like me in there to help. But the way the prison system works in the UK is if you go into a prison and you're not registered, you can only go in three times in one year. If you want to go in any more than that, you have to go through all the CRB checks and be registered as a proper contractor. That's my understanding of it. So that's, that's like the logistics part that has been so difficult because in order for you to be registered as a proper contractor, you need to be on a system called the Dynamic Purchasing System, the DPS. And you can go on and bid for work on that system as a government contractor. So for instance, if a prison said, we need help uh, reducing violence, can you all put your bids in? I would, my, the company which I set up since this, I was last on the CIP project, we would put a bid in and say, we can help with this, we can, we can deliver this product to help. And just getting a company onto the dynamic purchasing system, which is a government portal, yeah. The logistics of that, Sean, are ridiculous. Like the forms you've got to fill in, the insurances you've got to have, the you've got to have slavery statements to make sure you're not, you're not, you know, it's not slavery. You haven't got people working for you for nothing. Yeah. So that's the logistics of of, of trying to get into a prison and help people is so difficult. Before you proceed, let me just tell people who you are that have not seen the first podcast and are not aware of you. So, if you've not seen the first podcast, then in the description box below this video is a link to it, as are links to all of other Michael's stuff. So, I urge you to go down and, and click on his l links and support his in important work. So, for those of you who saw the first podcast, hardcore, Michael, as a young person, was doing armed robberies. He's innocent for uh, attempted murder, but he ends up getting sent to the big house for attempted murder. And because of the way he's been indoctrinated into crime, he's buzzing, you know, the first day, this is from his book, Young Offender. Um, first day he enters notorious Feltham Young Offenders prison, Michael was excited. He was going to be a legend to all his mates. 16 year old was in for attempted murder although he's innocent of this particular crime, but amongst the violent and dangerous young men on his wing, he was about to learn exactly how far he'd go to survive. And, you know, Michael really opened up, told us a harrowing story of abuse and the factors that led to him committing these crimes. And he's turned his life around now. He's hugely successful. 
And he's now going into prisons and trying to help other fellas and, and women. Have you been in any women's prisons? Only one. I went into Send and it, it didn't really go well. I didn't. I went. I spoke in Send as well. Did you really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mate, I, uh, I've been in a lot of men's prisons with lifers. Yeah. And the most intimidating prison for me was the woman's prison. Yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. like, I felt like I was a bit of meat that was about to get savaged. Yeah. Yeah, it was funny though, because they were asking me all, they'd read my books, they were asking me all these questions about my ex-girlfriends, and it got crazy in there. Hey, I was the same, mate. I was yeah. glad, you know, I'm very sad to say it, but I just stick to helping men now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think women should help the women, men should help men. So some of the men in these prisons told you their own harrowing stories. Mm. Are you able to describe any of those stories to us? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, obviously I can't give away any names, but I can share my experience and, and what I learned. You know, I think probably one of the first workshops I delivered, because I set up the CIP project. CIP stands for Change is Possible. And, you know, I've been sober 13 years. I've done, you know, 13 years of self-development in all different areas. And I learned what worked for me, what helped me change my life, be sober, be a loyal father, loyal husband, and also a successful businessman, right? And that's what I deliver in the prison. And I think the first one I'd done was in uh, Felton Young Offenders shortly after, you know, book was released. And, um, you know, I spent time in Felton. So I have, my heart's in helping them guys in there. And um, one of the big questions for me was growing up was no one really stopped to ask me, why are you so angry? Talk to me about your anger. And I believe there's four primary emotions we feel, you know, anger, fear, love, uh, ang anger, fear, sadness, joy, right? And so that's what I really touch on is them. And I went into Felton Young Offenders. I had 14 inmates. Um, I made sure the founder, there's a charity in Felton Young Offenders called uh, Friends of Felton. And I asked him to come along. Um, and I asked if some of this, some of the, governors could be there as well just to witness because I knew what was going to happen was powerful but me telling someone in charge that isn't enough people need to see it for themselves and uh, <clears throat> so they give me 14 inmates and 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 like a lot of the time what they do the prisons often select the most troublesome ones and say right give give Michael these lot he should he could probably sort these lot out right mm. And they were, you know, they, they, they were, they're a troublesome group, uh, 14 young men, all young black men, one white guy. Um, and we, we, we open the, the workshop where we check in honestly. And on the second round, I invite them to tell me about your anger. And we had a young man who was just trans, uh, transferred from A side over to B side. So these were all B siders. And, um, and he, this, this kid was, he's only 18, but he's massive, sure, like huge. And he's first in line. And I was looking, when this guy come in, I was thinking, this is, he's the most scariest guy there, but often they're the most easiest to figure out. And so I said, why don't you start? <clears throat> Tell me about your anger. He was like, I'm not fucking angry, bruv. I'm not fucking angry, right? And I said, you know, when I... When I started this workshop today and I asked you guys to tell me something about yourselves, you automatically told me what you're all in for. And 90% of you are in for violent crimes. So I don't believe you when you say, I don't get angry. And he went silent and there was a whole, there was a whole silence in the room. And part of my work is allowing that silence and sitting in it, not trying to change it, just sit in, it, sit in this awkward silence, get them to really figure out why are you angry? He said, I'm not fucking angry, bruv. And I said, all right, well, we're, we're just, you know, never, never a time in your life. You've never been angry at all. The silence went on and on. And he put his knees on his hands like that. And he said, I'm fucking angry my mum's dead. And the energy in the room shifted. And I come over to him and I kneeled in front of him and I asked him to look at me. And I said, what is this now you're feeling now? And a tear dropped. And I held his hand. And I said to him, 
I'm gonna sit with you right now in this sadness. I'm not fucking going anywhere. I'm right fucking here with you. And he cried, this, wow. this, this, this tough guy. And wow, that was powerful. It was, it was a powerful moment, yeah. And this is just one moment of a full day I had with these guys. There was more moments like this. But I invited him up into the middle of the room. And we all, always sit in a circle when I do my workshops because it makes everyone's voice equal. Everyone's equal. There's not a boardroom where people at the top. It's, we all sit in a circle, everyone's voice is equal. We can all see each other. I invited him into the middle of the circle and I invited every other inmate, including the prison guards, to come in and give him a hug. We're gonna have a big group hug. And I, it's all about consent. So I asked him, are we, are, would you mind us doing this? And he gave his consent and we all come in and we all hug this, this, this young man and, and the prison guards done it as well. And he sobbed in the middle of this circle of men. And I had this moment, Sean, I looked over at the, the two prison guards who were there and they were looking at me like we were cavemen and I'd just made fire for the first time. They were looking at me like, how has he done this within the first, let's say, hour, hour and a half of being here? And it was, it was one of their moments where it was like, in the right circumstances with the right person, young men, no matter how horrific their crimes are, can, I, can open up. And this young man in particular was in for um, murder and possession of a firearm. 18 year old kid um, made a mistake whilst he was high. Was it, oh okay, was it a robbery? Or? Well, he didn't go into the details of all of it and I don't really need the details. I just need to, you know, help him, you know. Yeah. But what really came out of my interaction with him was he had a moment in red mist a drunken moment in red mist and he'd made one mistake and he was serving, you know, I think he was serving 17 or 18 years or something like that. And there was more of it around the room and it was, it was like, we had these powerful moments, Sean, and I thought to myself, this is it. Felt, I'm gonna make such a difference in Fat Young Offenders. I've got the people in the room to make this happen. And at the, end of the, at the end of the workshop, everyone was buzzing. It was like, they were, they were like new men. You, you're like a couple of them who shed tears looked different. They looked like different people, like they'd let something go. And I remember thinking to myself, this is it, like Felton can't say no to this. This is like, you're like I've got, it, this, this has got to happen. And every inmate filled out a feedback form all of them saying, please, can we have more of this? This is life-changing stuff. And I left Felton that day convinced this is gonna go somewhere. And, and it just went quiet. And they said, we've got some other forms you need to fill in. And I filled in some other forms and I sent the forms. This is over like a six month period of me chasing, 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 chasing. I even involved a local MP and they weren't interested and uh, I filled the forms out, sent it to them, and I got, I got a sort of two sentence email back saying, yeah, we've checked the forms and we're not interested. And I said, um, I, was, I was shocked, mate, and saddened, really. I was like, you know, how can you, you guys, and the guy who responded to me was one of the officers who was in on the workshop on the See, day, yeah, he's see. seen it, and I'm like, Mate, how can you say no to that? You saw what happened that day. And I said to him, okay, fair enough. Could I at least have a copy of the feedback forms? And I asked him at the time, don't destroy them feedback forms because I can use them. He said, yeah, I need to take them and I can present them and fight your corner. And I said, okay, well, fair enough. If it's a no, that's fine. But can I have a, a copy of them feedback forms? And he said, the feedback forms have been destroyed. And I've got this all on email, you know. And I was just like, wow, like what more can someone do? Like I'm an ex-inmate who's reformed, I'm going there, I'm doing it for free. You've got 14 feedback forms, you've got everyone in the room saying it's positive, and you still say no? 
And it was an interesting moment when I, <clears throat> when I really, because I'm, I'm quite a pragmatic person, Sean, and I looked at that and I thought, what could I have done differently here, you know? And I thought the first thing I could have done was kept the feedback forms, right? So I took that in and then I thought maybe instead of just having normal governors, I have senior governors in the room next time. And so that's what I set up, you know, and I had lots of requests off the back of our podcast. And one of them was from um, a, a prison officer at Swaleside Prison, a guy called uh, Richard Davies. I'm sure he won't mind me mentioning his name. This guy is like a golden nugget in the prison system. I swear he's an officer who really, really cares. And he wanted me to come in and I said, <clears throat> okay, great, I'm gonna come in, um, but I want this to happen. So I want the head of emotional well-being. I want the head of uh, your, your therapeutic person. And I want, I want these serious people in the room when this workshop happens so you can see. I want the decision makers in the room, basically. And so uh, we've done the same at Swaleside. And, um, and the big moment at Swaleside was when we spoke about sadness. And what, uh, what Swaleside done, they picked um, their lifers. So they picked 14 men who were all lifers, predominantly murderers. Um, a, couple in there, a couple of them were, you know, committed multiple murders. Um, Deep end then. They, they, these guys were sort of, um, I, think, I think they thought, okay, we, Michael, if you want all of this stuff, if you want all these people in the room, then we're going to give you the cream of the crop and let's see what you can do with them. And, um, and I always start my, my workshops. I level the playing field. It's like, I'm not getting paid to be here. I'm not any better than you. I'm not a teacher. I'm one of you. And we sit in a circle. Everyone's equal here. So I leveled a playing field, and um, and one of the one of the big moments was when we spoke about sadness. I said, "Tell me about, talk to me about sadness in your life." And any man can start, and you wait, <laughs> and and sometimes it's an awkward silence, Sean. You sit and you wait and you wait, and normally someone will talk just to end the awkward silence, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that's okay. You know, um, but it came to a young man who, w he was a bit of a red flag to me before I went in there. They said, we've got a guy, a young white male. He was in for murder. He was only, he was only 21 and he, he was sentenced to 22 years because he pleaded uh, not guilty. And he was a, he was a, a he was a, a house party, a fight broke out, everyone was drunk and a fight broke out and, and his, one of his friends got into a fight and he beat the guy, but the guy who got beat said, I'm, I'm, going, I'm coming back to my mates and I'm, gonna, and I'm gonna bring a knife and I'm gonna stab you up. And they thought nothing of it, the party continued. About two hours later, the group came back. It turned out, the guy didn't have a knife. He just said it in a drunken thing, I'm gonna stab you up. But this young, young kid um, took it as literal, my friend's gonna get stabbed, and he pulled a big knife out of, uh, out of the kitchen, and, uh, and he ran out, and he stabbed this, this other young kid to death. And he pleaded not guilty on the grounds of, um, he suspected his friend was gonna get stabbed, uh, you know, and other witnesses said they heard him say he was going to get stabbed. So he he went into that court case thinking he wasn't going to get convicted of it, and he got he got found guilty. And because he got he pleaded not guilty, he got a worse sentence. He got twenty two years. And so the prison officer said to us, Michael, you know, this this young man really needs help. He, he's fighting everyone, he's attempted suicide multiple times. Um, and when I went into the room, you could see it on him, cuts up his wrist, he had two black eyes. Um, you could just see the pain in this young man. And, um, and I could feel it as it was getting closer to him. The emotion, it was, it was like here, Sean. It was like it was just waiting to pop. 
he'd never, it seemed like he'd never been asked to talk about his sadness, which just amazes me. And, um, and his big thing was that um, he, when he, when he got convicted of it, all his friends and all his friends and friends of friends went to his parents' house, like saying, protesting, sort of saying how bad he was for what he'd done for killing this kid. And so he'd been ostracized from his community, even to the point where he had children and the children were getting stick at school. So it, it's like the effects were huge for, his, for him and his family. And the best way he knew how to deal with that was to distance himself from all of it. So he hadn't written any letters to his, his partner and his kids. He hadn't allowed any visits. He'd completely gone, he, he just hadn't spoke to anyone. And that's what his sadness was. He was like, I miss my fucking kids. I miss my fucking partner and my kids. I miss my mum and my dad. And I don't think what I've done I can ever be forgiven for. And, and, and he just burst into tears. And you know, it was this moment of like, you looked around the room and there was other inmates crying because they were also murderers. You know, who, who had done something in a moment, a drunken moment. And Sean, we know, we've had drunken, I've had drunken moments where I've done things that I would never do when I'm sober. Just lucky I never got convicted that of something that I have to spend the rest of my life in prison. And that was a moment where the whole energy in the room changed from him showing that level of vulnerability. And it came around to, we carried on going around the circle and it came to um, the prison officers um, opportunity to share his sadness because I invite him in the circle as well because there needs to be bridges built between officers and prisoner and prisoners in my opinion and I asked him to share his his sadness and his sadness was that he is he kept this guy is a good officer he really cares and his wife used to work at the prison and his wife got a job at the prison because of him because he she picked up on his enthusiasm to make a difference. And one day a few prison officers tried to escape and they kidnapped his wife, took her in the cell and beat her up. And the wife had- Some prisoners tried to escape. Some prison officer, his wife got a job in the, prison as, in the prison as a governor, yeah. as a prison officer. Yeah. And prison of, uh, a couple of inmates tried to escape. Inmates, yeah. You said prison officers tried oh, to escape. Sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry. My bad. And a couple of inmates tried to escape from the prison and took his wife, who was now a prison officer there, yeah. hostage in a cell. Wow. And beat her up. <sighs> and she was off and she had PTSD. But this, off, this prison officer was still there. He was still there trying to help. I wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for him. And... Uh, and he cried. He cried, it was like, I care about you guys so much, but my wife at home is, is like, she's almost gone to the opposite of like, you know, I, you can't help them guys. You know, you need to leave that job. And he was like, I'm, I'm playing this tug of war of, of trying to help. And he, and, he, and he cried. And I again invited him into the middle of the circle. And every inmate come round and hug this prison officer. And again, I had this moment, I looked over, I looked over at the senior officer who was there watching this and the head of emotional well-being, and I was thinking, this is, this is gonna, this has to sign the deal. When do you see this? You know what I mean? I was like, this is, you don't see this. And I asked, I asked him to sit back down and I, and I offered for feedback, which I don't often do, and I said, I, I want, Richard, if you're open to getting feedback from these inmates so they can tell you their feedback. And all of them, <laughs> some of them were like, who, who are the fucking inmates who've done it? We want to go and get them, right? And, and some of them were just like, you're a fucking hero. Like, I can't believe you still come to work to help us after that happened to your wife. And there was this new level of respect and understanding between inmates and prison guards that was just so powerful. 
And after, the, after that whole day, there was some beautiful moments in that day, Sean, and I sat down with, uh, I forgot his name now, the, the, he was like the, the sort of deputy of, of Swaleside Prison, and I sat down with him, and I thought, this is the moment where they're gonna tell me, you have to come back and have a regular slot here. And I wasn't even asking for money, right? And they said to me, um, okay, well, listen, this is how it works. You need to get onto a thing called the dynamic purchasing system. And once you're on there, you need to bid for work. And it all sounded very simple. I was like, oh, great. He was like, yeah, you just go online, register your company, the CIP project, and do it. So anyway, it wasn't until I went on this government website and realized what a minefield it is of trying to get it all done, which was a journey in itself. I was just thinking, bloody hell, why is it so hard for me to help for free? Anyway, I've done it all. And a, How long did that take? It took weeks. Oh, God. It took weeks, mate. It was a full-time job Oof. of sitting at my desk for weeks. I had to get solicitors to draw up a slavery statement that I'm, like, just a statement to say I'm not going to employ someone as a slave. I was like, like, in case I, you're paying them less than the minimum wage. Anyway, it's really boring. But I got it all done thinking... Okay, this must be the missing piece of the puzzle that's going to open all the doors. And some bids came up with a few prisons that I was working with. Uh, ISIS, Cook and Wood, uh, Feltming Offenders, Cold and Lee. There was a, quite a few. And I thought, this is going to be great because I look at this contract. Uh, it's multi, multi-million pound contract that, com that some companies are bidding for. Some of the companies, which I'm not going to mention because, you know, I don't know what risk might be involved for me because they're multi-million pound companies assigned to rehabilitating inmates which, and they're not doing a great job. But I was thinking they're putting quotes in that are multi-millions of pounds. All I'm asking for is like 30 grand for the whole year just to cover my petrol expenses and other expenses for literature. And I was convinced I'm going to win this. And, um, and I got no. Every single one I applied for I got to know. And it was this real moment, Sean, of like, I don't think the system we have in place is set up to really rehabilitate these people. You know, I was like, I don't really think the system that we have in place really wants to rehabilitate people. I don't think they do. You know, and I remember when I come on your podcast the first time and you said this to me, Sean, at the end of the podcast, you said, Michael, it's a business. It's just a business. And I remember thinking, yeah, Sean's just, he, he, he's saying that. He's, it's because he spent time in a prison in America. I know in America, prisons are businesses. But it has to, for me, that must be the only explanation for this, that there's so much money involved in these companies winning these multi-million pound contracts that if you do rehabilitate people and the prison population does go down, these companies are going to be out of business, especially if it's someone like me who's rocking up and doing it for free. I'm like their biggest enemy. So that's where I've got to, you know, with, with all of it. I run, uh, and lots of your listeners have been on my men's retreats and workshops. And the links will be in the description box if you want to go on these retreats. Yeah. Um, and that's where I had to pick my battles now, you know, so I've had to retreat and think, okay, I can't keep banging at this door and hitting dead ends all the time. And, you know, you have to pick your battles. And, and, and so I've, the CIP project is a nonprofit organization and I run workshops in schools, colleges, prisons, and out in for members of the public. Anyone can come and take part in these workshops, but it's hard because you know, to say someone watching this wants to take part in your workshop, what is the procedure? Just, just follow us on Instagram or Facebook or find me on Instagram and send me a message. And we got a website, the CIPproject.com, um, and just reach out and get yourself booked on. You know, we're, we're a highly trained group of individuals um, who've got real life experience. You know, myself and another guy who helps me run it called Dave, ex inmate of HMP Wandsworth completely changed his life, living legally, got his own business, paying taxes, giving back as well. 
And I think, you know, these workshops that we put on, they're not expensive. You know, we do it just to cover costs. You know what I mean? Um, and, and get yourself onto them. And, and if you're curious about what other people say, go on our website and go to the What People Say website and or What People Say section. And you'll see we've got a wide range of people. We, we've even had police officers on there <laughs> as well. You know, an ex-paratrooper was on there. Um, a real mixed bunch of people that you bring men together, you give them that opportunity to open up. And they do. And it happens quite quickly as well. You know, and I think, I think the lived experience, Sean, in my opinion, and this is why I think part of why your podcast is so successful, lived experience is now more valuable than a college degree. Like, I don't want to... I don't trust someone who's got a college degree, but if you've been to prison, like me, I trust you. You know, because it's, it's common ground. You know, it's like you relate, you get it. And I think, I think the value of that is now becoming a bit more understood, you know. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it, it, it's a tough thing, you know, helping, it, helping out in prisons. And I know I can make a difference, but you know, I can only do one prison three times in one year and there's no money in it. It's all unpaid. Um, and so you can make a real difference to some men's lives, but you won't see them again for another year because of the current system we have. All right, a few things to say on this then. So on our channel now, the mantra is end the war on drugs, start the war on paedophiles. Yeah. But... This ties into the war on drugs, what you just said, and the justice system now being one of the biggest employers in the world. Yeah. Human beings are reduced to commodities, were housed for profits, not just by private prisons, but by hundreds of corporations from, and other entities such as prison guards unions. Free strikes law in America, they got people serving life for stealing pizzas, which cost the taxpayer $1.25 million, $50,000 a year. Um, and 25 to life. They tried to get it repealed. The taxpayers are like, why are we paying for millions to house these guys? The people who put up the money to stop it was Prison Guards Union of California and Broadcom, exclusive provider of telephone services to the California state prison system. So that's just one tiny example of the hundreds of parasitic contractors that are locked onto the lifeblood of human beings reduced to commodities. Now in America, the highest arrest category was um, weed possession at the peak of the war on drugs. Almost a million arrests a year to fill the private prisons. So like you said, America's gone to this extreme. One in 100 adults in prison, 25% of the world's prison population. But the Americans are sick of it and there's a backlash and weed's getting decriminalized and legalized at the state level. That's the people voting for it, not the government. So these predatory corporations are like trying to get their tentacles around the world right now. In this country, we've got the highest incarceration rate in Europe right now. Yeah, you've talked about the murders and that, but a lot of it is to do with the criminalization of addiction, people with mental health issues. In America, mental health people, the prison is the biggest house of them, yeah. over and above me mental health facilities. So all these people are just fodder for these companies. And in America, in Arizona prison, you get out, you get gate money, it's called $50. They say, have a nice day. And they know by allowing it to be drug and gang infested mayhem and not giving them what you've got to give them, they're going to go right away and steal for some food. Or they're going to go and try and get high. Because if they were arrested for weed in the beginning, they've got a heroin addiction by the time they get out. So they're going to go straight after that $50 is gone back to crime. As soon as they get rearrested, $50,000 taxpayers' money back to the prison. So you are the enemy of this profit-making opportunity. And who is it, you know, you said you saw on this system the million dollar, million pound contracts. They're going to people who are our political leaders, business associates and cronies. And at the end of the day, they're always gonna take care of their own and they're not gonna look at what you've got to offer because you're not in with those guys. You, you, you're actually taking away from the money that they're going to make if you rehabilitate people. So it is absolutely sickening. Now, there's good and bad in every profession. And you mentioned the guard who's like really rooting for the prisoners. And you're going to get people like that. But if you look at the pyramid structure of control and ownership 
of government and politics and business, the people at the top are completely and utterly psychopathic. All they care about is, is just power and money in their own self-interest, and, it, and it, it's sad. Mate, it is sad, and I think I'd, I'd love to just expand on that a little bit because that was one of my big arguments when I was I was uh, I got asked by Dame Carol Black to come into the Home Office to give a talk to them about yeah. this whole thing that needs to be changed. And you know, if you if it, if you look at the statistics of the most underprivileged people the people who've suffered the most physical and sexual abuse, if you want to find where all these people are, just go to your local prison. Like the local prison is where we house the most people who've suffered physical, uh, sexual abuse and neglect, um, and the most underprivileged people. So the people who grew up in poor families. Our solution for them so the year is 2020, right? Our solution for these people, the large portion of these people, is to lock them up for 23 hours a day in a cell with people they don't even know. And Sean, this is children as well, mate. Yeah, Cook and Wood is where I ran one of my workshops, 14 to 17 year olds. 14 year old kids in there. During lockdown, during the coronavirus lockdown, they were locked up for 23 and a half hours a day they're only allowed out for a shower and they're not allowed any visitors. So you imagine a 14 year old boys and girls locked up 23 and a half hours a day, um, not allowed to see any family. Like, can you just imagine the psychological effect that is gonna have? Could you imagine if you'd done that to a dog? If you locked a dog in a room for 23 and a half hours a day, away from any other of its, any other, you know, like, I really think, Sean, we're going to look back, generations will look back in 100, 200 years, and they're going to be like, wow, we were savages. Look at what we've done to the most traumatised, underprivileged members of our society. This is how we treated them. And I'm glad you mentioned about the corporation, Sean, because I'm not brave, I wasn't brave enough to mention them. Because these are multi-million pound companies with, with links, some links to uh, the government. Not everyone in the government is bad, by the way, because I've met some, some people who really do care, but um, I certainly wouldn't be one of upsetting them people with so much power. But when you look at the companies that are given million pounds to do this, and then you look at some of the backhanders that go on, boxes at Tottenham Hotspur, uh, pictures of them together, you're like, you can see where this money goes and you can see where this money stays. It stays in a certain little group. And you're right, I am the enemy. You know, a reformed armed robber who's successful enough to go and do this for free, I don't need their money, and who can actually rehabilitate people. They're like, get out of here. You are not welcome here, mate. And that's why I, I believe that there's so many hurdles. But. You know, I've I've met some people in uh, in Parliament, and I went into the Houses of Parliament, and I, and I done a talk in there, and I've met some people in power that are serious about change. So I I think change will happen, but again, it starts with people like you giving places opportunities to people like me to share my story because I'm I was unknown, mate, really, until I I came on here. So again, it's it's the ripple effects of you know, giving people a platform, you know, not just on a podcast because they're a celebrity. Like, we don't really want to hear a celebrity. We want to hear about the, the guys who've... People who've lived life. Lived celebrities lived life. are boring yeah. fucking stories, aren't they? Mate, I'm telling you, they really are, you know. My question for you then is, what is the meaning of life? Let me just back that up a bit. Because, all right, when I was a teenager, I watched Wall Street, greed is good. I've got to make a million by the age 30. That was the meaning of my life. And look what that got me melting down and fucking six years of incarceration. So got out after reading a lot of books on philosophy and psychology, I had to reappraise that. Mm -hmm. Did the yoga, did the meditation. I know you go down that route as well. Mm -hmm. So when I talk to an audience and I can see like, how it's affecting them. Like I'm actually there in front of them and I can see and I feel the energy in the room change. When I go into schools and speak to the kids and you know, they thought drugs was glamorous and cool and I show them the horror of it. And they're all like on the edge of the seats. And then 
they ask all these questions and I'm driving home. I have this feeling, like a connection with the universal feeling. Mm. That's nothing to do with money or success or anything. And I say to myself, is this the meaning of life? Mm. Do you have anything like that in what you're doing? Like when you've seen those guys break down and cry, but it's a catharsis mm -hmm. and you see the faces change, something's lifted out of them and they look lighter. How does it make you feel? Exactly the same as you. And that is that for me, Sean, is the meaning of life. Yeah. The meaning of life is, is, is giving back. Yeah. Just give. Yeah. Just give. Just if you give, it comes back. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think it makes me so sad when you see people, they give just to get likes or follows or money or fame. You know, I've been giving my time for free in prisons for 12 plus years. And it, a prison inmate can't follow you or like your post <laughs> and the prison won't pay you. But they're the, pe they're the ones that need it the most. And I think, you know, it's um, mental health and all of this stuff, Sean, it, it's become like a business, you know, and it's become cool. And there's a lot of people out there now preying on people's vulnerability, you know? And, and, it, and it, I think, look, each to your own, do your thing, but just be mindful of what you promote, you know, because if, if, if you're working in the field or, or anything to do with mental health on social media, but you drink alcohol, you're playing a very dangerous game because I don't know how you can be an advocate for mental health, but still use a substance that naturally depresses the mind and leads to suicidal thoughts if consumed enough. And that's, that's a risky thing that I, I see is a lot of people in this field now of helping others to, make, to get rich or to get famous, but then uh, seen in pubs having a pint with their mates. And for the guy who's really struggling with mental health, like for me, you know my story, when I drank, it led to me when I drank and used drugs, it led to me really trying to kill myself. And that's where it becomes dangerous. You know, you're playing with people's lives here, you know, and you, it, it's just a delicate subject. And I think you're gonna see a lot of people getting exposed. I'm not sure if you're familiar with one of these motivational speakers, but a guy called Jay Shetty. Um, and he's been exposed now, you know, of you taking quotes of other people's quotes and other pe interesting things other people put in their books He's took it and used it all as his own and he was made millions off it, right? And I think some legal actions come into him now because he's like a multi, multi-millionaire. But that's a good example of, um, you know, give back just to help the world. Don't do it for fame. Don't do it for money. Just the good things come back round. They, it will come back, but just sometimes you just have to be patient for it. Like for me, it took 12 years to get a book deal. I was in prisons doing this work for 12 years and then Pan Macmillan were like, we'd like to write your life story, but it comes, eventually comes. And I think for me, that's, that's what life is about. You know, you wanna change the world, Ch start by changing yourself. And then once you've changed yourself, now you have something to give. You can only give away what you've got. You know, so it's like, if I wanted to be a professional footballer, I wouldn't call up Anthony Joshua and say, can you help me become a professional footballer? He'd say, no mate, go and see David Beckham. Why are you calling? I can't, I'm a boxer. And I think it's the same thing in, in life. If you're looking for inspiration or you're looking for hope, think about this first. What do you want for your life? And does this person have what you want? So if you want to be happily married, is this person you're seeking out for advice happily married? If you want to be sober, is this person sober? Because if they're none of them things, how can they help? If they can't achieve it for themselves, how are they going to help you achieve it? And I think there's a lot of reframing that needs to be done in this whole field of, of helping others, you know, because it's getting a, it's getting a bit of, risk, of a risky business. And, a, you know, you're seeing a lot of people getting famous and rich off it which is 
is sad because the people who can really make a difference often get left in, in the shadows. And um, there's so many unsung heroes out there, you know? I think the motivation from it should come from the heart and helping people put a break on my ego because it was as big as the Grand Canyon in Arizona. And then when you, you start help, I start helping people in the prison and stuff like that, you know, teaching the Mexicans how to write home in Spanish, reading the legal paperwork. And it, you hear the sad stories then as well. It's good for the soul. Mm. That's how I learned that, you know, a lot of these prisoners have done these things, thrown away as kids, suffered horrific abuse, seen the parents die, got on the heroin because they were never given the tools to deal with these things psychologically. So they're, they're numbing it with the heroin. We're arresting them for that and putting them somewhere where they're punished so harshly, it's like a doubling of the trauma that they've already suffered as kids. We expect them to fix themselves and become model citizens. Mm. So I do a life lessons talk to school kids and I tell them go out and, and do some charity work and stuff like that. Mm. But one of the most profound days of my life, one of the most um, heartbreaking and I had to really, my, my sister's little kid when she was one and a half years old was diagnosed with leukemia. So she was living in and out of, um, Great Ormond Street Hospital. So I went the day and spent the day in with the kids that, that were all little kids with shaved heads and stuff. And my sister said, um, my daughter's got childhood leukemia, your niece's got childhood leukemia, and it's 90% survival rate because of the advances in technology. But see those kids over there and those families, they're not even going to make it till Christmas. So after spending the day in there with those kids, I, I was meant to just walk to the tube and go home. I couldn't. I walked around London for hours and hours and hours, just fucking contemplating the meaning of life and thinking, how can this even be? Those little kids who've done nothing wrong, they're not even going to see Christmas. Mm. But that then, it, 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 it motivated me more to, um, to try and influence people in a positive direction. Yeah. So people, if you spend time with people who've been traumatised or are severely sick, spend some hours with them, it's going to make you reflect on your, what, your own behavior and, and perhaps steer you a bit in a more positive direction. That's a good, good thing to get out there and do. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I think an important point in that, Sean, and I honor you for the work you do. You know, it's inspirational stuff, mate. You know, and it, you don't, it, you're humble about it. You don't broadcast it. You just do it. And that's what I love about you. Um, but when you speak about the people being traumatized, I'd done a workshop in Cook and Wood with uh, 14 to 17 year olds. Uh, half of them were, were doing life. Four of them were murderers. Um, they gave me 10, 10 kids, I had them for a day, all uh, black kids. Really sad to see, you know, the prison the population is now getting really in the south of England. I'm not sure what it's like up north, but in the south, the, as I've over 12 years, I've slowly seen the room become more black kids. It's it's really sad. But when we speak about traumatized, some people don't even know that they've experienced trauma mm. because it's just normal. And when I ran this workshop in Cook and Wood. Um, we spoke, we had an open discussion, part of it was to talk about um, trauma and violence in, as, in your childhood. And it was really interesting watching this, this young group of kids, and I can really relate to this because my mum come from a gypsy background and, you know, gypsy, <laughs> you know, they're quite quick to give you a backhand, right? So my mum was quite openly, she'd give you a slap about and that. And a lot of my black friends, their parents, their mums were the same. Quite, they wouldn't mind giving them a, giving them a slap. And um, and when we opened this discussion up, all of them burst into laughter. Oh man, you know, isn't it funny? My mum used to lick me down. Yeah, my dad used to give me the belt, and you know, oh belt, man, my one used a bamboo stick, and uh, they were like joking and laughing about how they were physically beaten by their primary caregivers. Um, and I sat there, I didn't enge engage in the banter, but I let it all die down and I said, um, how old were you when this first started? And for some of them, they couldn't remember. They said, I think it was when I was four or five. For some of them, it was about eight. And I said, okay, so I'm just checking out with you. 
how you would feel if I brought an eight-year-old boy in here now and I took my belt off and I started beating him in front of you. Oh, no, no, well, that's different, bruv. That's different, that's different. You know what I mean? He's just a kid. He's not, he's not your kid. All right, okay, cool, cool. Okay, so I bring my daughter in, who is eight, and she was eight at the time, and I take my belt off and I start beating her. Is that okay? And you see them all sitting there thinking. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not saying your parents are bad parents or they're to blame for what you've done, but it, it, it's not okay to beat children like that. And I think, and the reason I press, I press quite hard on that, Sean, because it's a way of them understanding, you know, it's not okay. And I, I tie it up with a direct correlation. All 10 of them young kids were in for violent crimes. What were they taught by their parents? They were taught that when, we don't, when you don't do what I say, I will use violence to enforce my point of view. These kids are now all aged between 14 and 17. They've probably had one or two interactions where people haven't done what they wanted them to, and they've resorted to violence. So they're just replaying what they've learned from their primary caregivers, which they don't even know wasn't okay. They think they laughed and joked about it until I pointed out to them that it's not okay to, to beat children with belts, especially a five-year-old. One of them was five and he was laughing about it. And, it, and it's these conversations that need to take place with our youth. And, and that's the thing, and I feel emotional saying this, Sean, it really saddens me, mate, that why are there roadblocks put in front of me when I'm trying to help kids like this? Why? It's 2020, for Christ's sake. Like, if we're not gonna have this combo now, when are we gonna have it? The system's completely uncaring, and it's just all about numbers. It feels like it, mate. Yeah. It does. So those good people, and I saw them in Arizona. There was a um, priest, there was creative writing workshop teachers. There were guys who went and sat and did all the bureaucracy that took them weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks just to get in, not get paid, just to get in and try and influence some people. And then they'd show up. And the guards would be like, you know, you're not, there's something wrong with the way they were dressed or there's something, some, they failed some security and they wouldn't even let them in. Oh, we're on lockdown today, you can't come in, yeah. whatever. And they just put every barrier up in the world to try and keep these guys out. Yeah, I've had, I've had exactly the same. I've had exactly the same, mate. You know, like, I, I've got, it's hard to find young men um, who have legitimately turned their life around as it is, that's hard. To then find them and say to them, would you be willing to come to a prison with me, unpaid, take your day off work, unpaid, to come and help people that you don't even know, <laughs> right? It's hard, mate. But one of the big things that I try to do, I've got um, a great friend of mine called um, Sam Aremu, who uh, a black guy went to prison, um, and has legitimately turned his life at, around. He'd be a great guy for your podcast, by the way. Um, but I convinced him to come in. And so what happens is we get to the prison and we get to the gate and we're sitting there. He's taking a day off work, unpaid. And, he, and he's got a wife and kids. And he's not like me, got a big business where he can afford to just take a day off. He's losing money, right? And we get to the prison and there's been an altercation on the wing and coincided with one of the prison officers on that wing has taken a day off. So we can't do it. But they don't call you and tell you before you've left, they tell you when you're at the prison. And it's like, <laughs> we get, we're so close to help, like the inmates are just on the wing and we're at the gate. We're so close to helping and we fail right at the gate. And it's just like, it's a crime. It's a crime, mate. It's a, it's, it's a crime against humanity. 
there are bigger criminals running the system than there are convicted criminals in the system. I'm telling you, mate, because the less inmates that get reformed, the more victims of crime when they get released. Because what are they going to do when they get released? They're just going to commit more crime. And then there's more victims. You know, and it's, it's okay for these, these multimillionaires sitting in their private, you know, jets and houses. You're not going to be affected by that. But the average person on the street who is, who's robbed for a handbag or owns a shop that's been smashed to bits, they're, they're the ones who pay the price for not rehabilitating these young men, you know? I'd love to see more of a global movement around it. I'm very lucky. I've met some quite influential people in government, but you just don't know. You just don't know because the amount of money involved in this, Sean, I, I, I it's going to take a lot. It's going to take a lot to see change. I've had politicians show up at my talks and they get, because it creates an, a, a high, a, like an emotional high in the audience. They come up to, up to me at the end of the talk and promise the world and as soon as they've gone, I never hear from them again. Mm. Yeah. 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 I've had the same. I've had the same. Not all of them, but certainly, certainly some of them. It, it's like a little thing where they want to just look good for a moment, like they're doing yeah. their bit. Um, once that's been done and it's been documented in the local newspaper, whoosh, they're gone. They feel that they lose votes if they become, if they are shown to be soft on crime. Yeah. So programs helping people in prison. A tabloid newspaper could say, you know, murderers getting program at taxpayers expense, pedos getting program at tax. That's what the tabloids do. They're so shit scared, these politicians, that something like that may happen as a consequence of them authorizing that program, that they're gonna lose votes. All they care about is the votes. So in the Scandinavian countries now, prison policy has been taken out of the hands of politicians and they're having hugely positive results in terms of recidivism and educating the guys and getting them out there and being productive members of society because the politicians they're just phonies they're just phonies I, I, I've seen that in Scandinavia isn't it they yeah. they treat them like human beings yeah don't they they give them a, a nice room and they give them access to education and therapy I saw a documentary on it and, and it's like, it's incredible, isn't it? And surprise, surprise, they don't re-offend when you do that, yeah. when you don't treat them like animals. Yeah. And they go out and they live a happy life and <laughs> it's like, we should just literally take that system and, yeah. and just bring it here. And, and the fact that we're not, and the fact that it's so difficult to help, it just puts a question mark over the whole thing. You're like, there's, there's something darker here. There's something darker at play here. You know, and, and especially, you know, we talk about um, a lot of this in the, in the media at the moment about Black Lives Matter and oppression. And it's, it's quite subtle. What goes on here is very subtle, almost disguised. Yeah. And I wouldn't even say it's targeted just at black people. I would say it's targeted at anyone who is poor and, and experienced any trauma. Mm -hmm. The likelihood is that's where you're going to end up is in that system. Yeah and people are going to be making money off you. Yeah. So you've really answered well about, you know, what you've been doing since the last one, the barriers you've faced in doing these programs. A lot of the people watching this perhaps haven't seen part one. You said that there were some stories that you hadn't told us in part one from your life, and there were some stories you wanted to add some more detail to. So if you'd let us have those, please. Yeah, sure. I think when we done our first one, it, we covered so much, didn't we? And it's hard to sort of capture every single, every single bit of your life. But I know for me, there was a few things that went on in particularly around the, uh, the sexual abuse I experienced as a youngster that you, you, you think, yeah, there was a bit, there was a bit more that could be added to that story that was that was in some ways a lot more difficult than actually what happened. You know, when I was a, when I was a young child, and for those who haven't seen part one, I was I was uh, sexually and physically abused by by my uncle, um, and and as traumatic as that experience was, it sent me to a place in myself of almost complete denial. Like I refused to admit it happened because if it if it happened, I was 
I was weak or I was gay or I, they were like there was something wrong with me. Not to say there's anything wrong with being gay, but for me, I, I made it mean to be something bad about me. So I had to pretend it didn't happen. And it took me a long time to ever speak about it. It took me, you know, the first three, four years of being sober um, before I even uttered the words, this may have happened. And then I think it was, it was five, six years sober when I actually sat someone down and said, this is what happened. And, you know, when, um, when I read a book about, um, there was a book, book by, um, I think it was uh, Dr. Gaber May, and um, he said, so often the most traumatizing thing about sexual abuse isn't about the sexual abuse, it's about opening up to someone about the sexual abuse to then be told that, they're, that you're lying, that it didn't happen. Mm. That's often the most traumatic thing. And that was, that was, that was my experience. That's what happened to me, you know, with, with, with my mum and with uh, my aunties was, it took years for me to admit it to myself. It then took me years to open up to about it to, at that time, my sponsor in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and then to sit my family down and, and tell them, only to be told that never fucking happened. You're fucking making it up. And what it done was, it was like, it, it took all the shame I felt and it was like they gave it back to me. Like, this is your shame to carry. This is your guilt to carry. And it's like a burden. Sexual abuse, it, it, it's like a burden. It's like a dark, heavy weight over your shoulder that you carry that you make it mean that there's something wrong with you. Like, that you're a bad person, that you're not good enough, you're not worthy. Um, and that, for me, in terms of therapy took me a lot longer to untangle and process you know that for some people it's for some people it's very difficult to admit that your family member done that to another human being you know and um and since since the book was released and since since uh the, the, I filmed the podcast with you on the last episode. I've had the opportunity to go and meet some of the other victims that were sexually abused by my uncle, and I can't name them for for legal reasons. But you know, again, this, the, these people experience very similar stuff to myself. You know, but the people they opened up to were social workers, and social workers, you know, told them don't make don't make stuff up about your, your family. Don't make stuff up about your, your, your dad, you know. Um, and, um, and yeah, it was, it was, it was, that was one of the moments when, when I heard what they experienced and I tied it up with what I experienced, I knew it definitely happened because for a lot of years I doubted, did, did that actually happen? Like I remember this, but did it actually happen or was it? And then when you hear the details of it, it's, it's quite harrowing, Sean. You're like, crikey, this, this man left a legacy of just a trail of destruction. Wherever he went, children got hurt. You know, and um, I'll, I'll share with you one of the stories because I think it's quite, it's quite important when you see... It, it, was, it was a young girl who had reported abuse to social workers, social workers she'd reported it to, but no action had been taken. And this was in Northern Ireland. My abuser fled England and went to Northern Ireland where eventually he, uh, he, he was murdered, which is suspected by the IRA. Um, but this young girl had reported uh, abuse and, um, and one day she was in the middle of being pinned down and she knew what was going to happen. She was going to be raped again. And apologies for anyone listening. This is a, it could be quite triggering. But um, she managed to escape because he was quite intoxicated at the time. 
and she ran out into the middle of the street um, as a naked young girl. And just at that time was uh, a police car went past and she was pull, pulled in. And, and that's when action got took. It, it, despite that, she would have been nine at the time. And despite reporting it for two, three years prior, no action was taken. Mm. The action was only taken when, when a naked nine-year-old girl was found running down the road in Northern Ireland by a police officer. That's when it stopped. And it shows that it shows that's how bad it has to get before it stops. Like, and, and you know, she, she testified against him and within two weeks, it was, it was, it was leaked and he was murdered on, the, on a Saturday night, on a busy Saturday night on the streets of Belfast, very close to uh, Queen's University, murdered in front of lots of people. Did and they shoot it, him? No, he was, it was blunt instruments over the, over the head. So um, they never, there was, I mean, the road he was murdered on, <laughs> you look at it, you go that, to that road on a Saturday night, it's in the middle of student area. It would have been packed full of students drinking and partying. And Nobody saw anything. No one saw nothing. And you know, it, it's, part of this is like, look, I had to learn to forgive him for what he'd done to me. But there's also another part of me that feels like on some level, justice has been served for all the children that he hurt. You know, and he was also a child that was hurt. He was sexually abused by priests from, he was taken into a children's home when he was less than one year old. So he was sexually abused all his childhood. That's all he knew. That doesn't make what he done okay, but it helps you understand the bigger problem is like, Maybe if he was given the proper support around the trauma he experienced, he wouldn't have just acted out his trauma on other children. But again, it comes back to this is where we fail. We fail the most traumatized members of our society. And then we wonder why they go out into the world and commit horrific crimes on other human beings. And this ties into what we're saying about ending the war on drugs, start the war on paedophiles because if the cops weren't out doing all these low-level drug arrests to make their arrest quotas, and I saw one cop in America say, I go to a black neighborhood, it's like shooting fish in a barrel to make my arrest quotas. Drugs, 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 drugs. That girl, you said, you know, she for two years, she was crying for help and the cops weren't even looking at it because they're doing these other things that they could, the resources could be there to prevent that. Yeah, well, it wasn't, it wasn't the police in her case, it was the social services. And, and since there's a court case and she's had massive, there's been a compensation they've had for that because it was brought to their attention and no action, not enough action was taken to protect them. Well, we've had one guest on, Darren Jeffrey, and he was pimped out by social services. Yeah. It's absolutely obscene. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, when you look at my, my case, you look at all the things that happened in my childhood, it's, it's incredible that more action wasn't taken to protect me, you know? Yeah. And I think, I don't know, in a lot of ways, you, you think, crikey, the system is, isn't really doing what it's set up to do, you know? It's not really, it's not really doing it, you know? And especially when you look at like the, uh, I don't know if you watched that that documentary that was on the TV. The uh, I think it was called Five Girls. It's about the Rochdale grooming. And we've interviewed Maggie Oliver a few times. Right, got you. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. another good example. Is like you know that system there is set up to protect them girls, and they actually worked against them. She quit the police because one of the victims in particular. They ended up criminalising her, and social services tried to take away her kids after they told her to promise. Give us a statement, we'll take care of you. And they did the complete opposite. Unbelievable, yeah. Yeah, it's shocking. It's shocking. And the, the thing that, you know, bothers me with that, Sean, is, is where's the accountability? So where is that person taken who and held to account? 
the person whose job it is to protect these people, they need to be held to account, you know, publicly held to account. It's like you can't just give them a slap on the wrist or even just sack them because they'll just go to another social services in another town and probably just do the same thing. There needs to be some sort of criminal convictions put in place for people who fail us massive, on a massive scale. That's it. There is no accountability. Yeah. So you've got prosecutors in America putting people on death row when they know they're innocent so they can get headline news and get, get their careers enhanced. Yeah. My lawyer got one off. The prosecutors suppressed the evidence to show that it wasn't him and they got an expert witness in to say his bite mark, his teeth matched the mark on the victim when they knew it didn't. And it's called testy lying. And they, 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 even when they knew this guy was innocent, they tried to get him executed so the careers wouldn't unravel and it wouldn't be discovered. Yeah. That's how evil people are in the system. That's shocking, yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. And if people want to look that up, the case is the Snaggletooth killer, Ray Crone. And Ray Crone has done a short uh, little film with um, a wonderful group out of London um, who do little documentaries about exonerees. I can't remember the name of one in ten or something like that. We'll check it out on YouTube if you want to watch that. Um, all right, yeah, so are there any crime or prison stories you didn't tell us last time you want to tell us? Um, there was, you know, and we didn't, we didn't put it in the book, and it's often when Pam McMillan asked me to write my life story, I, I literally gave them everything, and they, they come back and they narrow it down and say, right, we don't need that. And, but there was, a, there was a couple of moments that were quite pivotal in my life especially in, in my days when I was committing crime was, was the two times I was stabbed. And it was a really, it was a, it was a funny period because for many of my teenage years, it was like you, you had a scrap, you had a fight, it like, and if you lost, you lost, right? And then it was, it was at some point, it sort of changed to, knives were now involved and I think it was because if you couldn't have a scrap you 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 had to protect yourself somehow you know against all odds and obviously in the UK it's a lot more challenging to get a get a firearm certainly a handgun maybe a shotgun might be easier but a handgun is is more challenging it was when I was younger anyway um and so yeah I mean the the first time I got stabbed I was um I was young, I, I was at school, and um, where I went to school, I went to a Catholic school, which was predominantly white kids from Irish families. Uh, you know, predominant religion in Ireland is, is Catholicism, so it's predominantly kids from Irish families. But you had other schools around it, you had another school, Lampton School, which was predominantly Sikh, you had Heathfields, which was predominantly Muslim, it had a mosque next to it. Um, and then you had Hounslow Manor, which was, you know, predominantly uh, a mixture of white, but predominantly black kids, and it had no religion attached to it. Now, I say all this, when I was growing up on my council estate, Sean, there was no race. Like, we were just a load of poor people <laughs> trying to get by. You know, there was no race. But when I, we went, when I went to secondary school, you were suddenly like, you noticed that there was, there was rivalries between different groups. And it's not necessarily that we chose to put ourselves in groups of white, black, Asian. It was like the schools had put us in, we, it was just a natural demographic of that school. And so, uh, one of the things we always used to struggle with was, you know, our school uniform, because we were a Catholic school, we wore blazers and ties. We always had to look pretty presentable, even though most of our homes were pretty unpresentable because obviously a lot of our parents were alcoholics coming from an Irish background. I'm not saying all Irish people are alcoholics, by the way. But it was just my experience of my friend circle. And, uh, and yeah, so we would often have run-ins with a lot of the a lot of the lads from from Heathfields and um, and Lambton School, and that's that's when it was during this time we we would we were having street little street fights here and there, and it weren't you know like there was no if you got knocked down there weren't no jumping on your head it was like 
ha 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 and you you run off but somewhere in the middle of it knives started coming in and i remember i had a street fight with with an asian kid um didn't think nothing of it and i didn't necessarily even win that in a win that fight in a spectacular fashion there was a few punches went back and forth and i you sort of know when a fight stops when someone's had enough and it, and and we stopped and then uh, we were walking through lampton park me and my friends and um i suddenly was walking and i heard like running and you know like it, it happened really slowly and I thought I heard, and I heard run, and I turned around like that, and so, and one of the agent, the agent get out of fight, have just launched over, and his knife went in here, in my, just as I, it's like, I just, like, the split second, I was like, turned around, and it went, it lodged in between the two sort of bones there, and so my arm was stuck like this. He done it, and he, and he ran off, and it actually didn't bleed that much because of where it is it's not a fleshy part and I remember just being in in shock we was like is that a knife that's a it's a fucking knife you know because back then when we were at school knives weren't it, you know it just weren't a thing and that was the first time I got stabbed <clears throat> and I remember going to the hospital in my in my school uniform and even some of the nurses looking at me like what the fuck is going on out in our streets now? You know what I mean? And I was wise enough even back then to just, you know, no comment, you know, obviously police get called and all that, no comment, I'm not, you know, and, and nothing ever actually came of that, but that's when my friends and other people in my community, we started, knives started making more of a, a common theme. And I remember the second time I got stabbed was, was by a friend of mine, actually. He became a friend, but he was more of sort of a bit of an enforcer when we first met. And we lived in, in Isleworth, and he brought a group of friends down from Hackney. And I guess nowadays you'd call it county lines, but he came into our community selling drugs and then started trying to get other people to sell drugs for him. And yeah, so now, nowadays you'd probably call that county lines, right? But... Um, one of the, one of his group one of the friends that he brought down from Hackney I I particularly hated he was just he was just a mouthy little shit and I thought the first opportunity I get I'm gonna beat him up but it was hard because he was like best mates with this guy um, and me and this guy I'm just gonna call him Johnny for for the sake of it um, and me and Johnny became friends because he started dating my girlfriend's sister. So it was like this balancing act of like, I mean him close enough yet for me to weigh in his mate. And, um, and it just happened one night that, you know, his mate got a bit mouthy, Johnny was looking the other way and I thought, great, I'm just gonna, uh, tonight I'm just gonna weigh you in. And I just weighed his mate in, who was like sort of small black kid, but really mouthy, just a, a real bully, would rob people and slap girls' asses as they walked past who, it was just, it was just, he was just vile human being. And I weighed him in and um, <clears throat> within sort of, I don't even know how quick it was, but we were up on, we were on Richmond Bridge. If anyone's been to Richmond, we used to drink a lot of Richmond River. And we was up on the top of the bridge and I would beating him up on the top of the bridge. And somehow the news had got down to Richmond River where Johnny was and Johnny had run up like sprinted up to protect his mate and someone had said Michael and I I turned around and Johnny pulled out he had a butterfly knife he'd always stab people with his butterfly knife and I've seen him open up multiple people with that horrific weapon and he he flicked it out and he lunged like this like as if to gut me like get me here and gut me and I was like and I moved back and it went in my hand, but I was like, I proper screamed. And then you saw blood. So he thought he'd stab me. He went, wiped it, put it, and he ran off. But I was like, fuck, fuck. And uh, I've still got it. You still see the, the, the hole in my hand. Yeah. 
And it was like, <laughs> it was just like, you know, these, these moments you look back on that you sort of normalized. It was like this horrific moment where <laughs> In Richmond as well. If you've been, have you been? You, I guess you've oh, it's been. Gorgeous, Richmond. It's a beautiful place, yeah, right? And this all happened on the bridge on a Saturday night, you know. And uh, it was just, you know, it's um, it's sad that it's becoming more and more common now. But that for me was another moment of like just trauma, really. You know, I I used to joke about that story and tell that story as if it was a funny thing and. But actually being being stabbed again, it was, you know, and we talk, you know, you mentioned earlier about higher power and God and all this sort of stuff. You know, I'm not religious, but it's moments like that, Sean, you get stabbed twice, you know, before your 21st birthday. You think something had to be looking out for me, for Christ's sake. I had so many moments, you know what I mean, where I shouldn't have just been dead. You said you saw him. Um, he he took his knife out on other people. Was that gang warfare stuff? Yeah, I mean, looking back now, you could label it as gang warfare, but when we were in it, Sean, we didn't have like a gang. We didn't have a name. We were just a group of kids. And then there was another group of kids from another area, but they weren't called We Are The TW Thing Gang or anything like that. We are just another group of kids. So One area against another area. Like one area against another, yeah, but there was... There was a guy who, who there was a rivalry between Johnny and this guy. And this guy went to prison and he knew, Johnny knew, and we all knew when that guy gets out, there's going to be, there's going to, there's going to have to be a little combo or there's going to be a war. And um, this guy came out of prison and he came straight to our neighborhood. He'd come out of prison and he was massive. He'd been pumping weights, you know, probably on the gear and everything, you know, but he was massive and he rocked up to all of us. And we're all sitting where we were. We normally used to hang about in Isleworth by the shop selling drugs and that, drinking. And we couldn't believe it. We were like, fucking look at the balls of this guy, mate. He's come on his own to a group of us. And he's come and he's, he's really mad. He's drunk <clears throat> and he started gobbing off to to uh, Johnny's brother and, um, and Johnny's brother, although he had a brother who was a complete lunatic, you wouldn't mess with, he was actually a lovely guy, yeah? And we were like, come on, stop that, leave him alone, you know, but he was just being a bit, a bit gobby. Anyway, someone called up, called up uh, Johnny and, and said to him, um, you need to get down here, Thingy's here, he's out of prison and he's giving it to your brother. And um, we saw Johnny, we all used to drive these bloody stolen mopeds, right? <laughs> he pulled up on his moped. And uh, he went up, he literally put, went up on his moped. We didn't even see the knife. He went up and then tried, poof, like that. The guy was standing there. I won't say his name because anyone who knows this story from my neighborhood will know who, exactly who we're talking about. But he just went, and it looked like he'd just give him a little uh, jab in the belly like that and we were like what just happened there and we and then we looked at his t-shirt he had a gray t-shirt on and suddenly the gray t-shirt went dark gray and we was like and 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 johnny was just back in and it was so quick you almost missed it and uh and the guy lifted up his top and his intestines were hanging out. Just like that. They were hanging out. And from when you've never seen that before, we were like, what the fuck is that? And he was even in shock himself. He he couldn't believe it. What's, and, what's the procedure with that? Are you supposed to try and put them back in or not touch them? Or how, how do you stop the bleeding? Mate, let me tell you what happened next. This, 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 is, this is how much of a lunatic this guy was. So this guy went, after he saw it, he went, you're gonna fucking die. Get on the back of the moped. I'm gonna take you to the hospital, right? And he, this other guy just got on the back of the moped, no helmet, and he drove, right? 
This all happened, Sean, in the space of about a minute and a half, right? Of Johnny pulling up, stabbing him, his intestines coming out, on the back of the open, he's gone. We was all just like, what the fuck just happened here? It was insane. And, um, and that was like the beginning of this sort of war we had with this other gang. You know, he, we all, the, in Isleworth, you've got West Middlesex Hospital. It's about a five minute walk from where we used to hang out and sell drugs from. We walked from, from there to the hospital. And there was all the nurses out there talking to him saying, what happened? How did you get that? And, uh, and, and Johnny had said to him, you, you tell him you fell on a bit of glass or something. So this guy was saying, I fell on a bit of glass and the nurses were saying, you haven't fell. Tell us what happened. <laughs> I fell on a bit of glass. So anyway, this happened, they, they cut him. They had to cut him right open. So he, had a, he, he got a scar on his whole stomach and they had to put it all, put him all back together. And we knew this wouldn't be the end of it. We knew it wouldn't be the end of it. And um, it was about two weeks later, naively, we were all standing in the, exactly the same place where the stabbing happened. We just, you're st just so stupid. If you wanted to arrest us or get us, we were always in the same place. And, um, and that's when, you know, um, cars with blacked out windows, motorbikes all come. And, and the way the, where we used to sit was located, there was a probably about a 50 yard distance. If you stopped at the road, we would see you coming. And, um, yeah, we looked at the distance. We saw the car, we saw multiple motorbikes and cars come, pull up bats, crowbars, um, and someone had a, a firearm and shot the firearm and we all just, we all just scarpered. There was, we had, there was girls there. There was, we were, you know, we just left everything. We had booze, everything. We all just scarpered. And that was the beginning of this sort of like a, a, a little war, you know, of like some of us, luckily for me, I never got, <clears throat> I never got injured in it. I, I, I injured a couple of it from their side um, when I caught them, but a couple of our guys just walking home on their own, group of guys pull up, just beat the shit out of them. Um, and, 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 you know, and that went on for two or three months until... How were you able to capture some of their guys? Yeah, it was just, you know, like, the thing was, one of them, and I've got to be careful with what I say here because, you know, people from my area will, you could piece this together and I don't want any re repercussions for this, you know, and I'm, I want to also say this on record. I'm not proud of this. I'm not glamorizing this. I'm documenting this is a real life look into, into my life. So if you were one of the people that were affected by this, I'm not proud of it and I apologize for my actions. Um, but yeah, one of them lived in our area. So when this started happening, we knew the, per the perfect target we were going to get was this guy who lived in, in the area. And that, and that was one of them, you know, we waited until he, he, he walked in a certain route. We knew his, he had a sister, we knew where she worked, you know, and we knew he took a certain route and that was it. We waited for him, you know, a few of us and it was, you know, it, it, we were never like vicious like if someone was knocked out we wouldn't jump all over their head we'd leave them you know what i mean and that i mean it's still vicious knocking someone out is vicious but you know there's an alleyway <clears throat> from where we used to hang out and anyone who lives in Isleworth will know this there's an alleyway you've got silverhall park and a big alleyway that you go through and it's a long alleyway long long alleyway it goes the whole way down to the river near the london apprentice and we knew he used to take that route and it's a long alleyway with no witnesses. And we just waited for that, you know, and, um, you know, he, he knew, he saw us from a distance and then we had people come up the other end and... That's well, not a good feeling. No, nah, he turned around to run and then he realized there was some up the other end as well, you know, and yeah. he tried to sort of, if you jump the fence into Silverhall Park, there's a river. So you either got to jump in the river to get across or the other side was into which is now an estate, but used to be the West, another part of West Middlesex Hospital. And um, 
there's there's moments like that, you know, where where you it, it was, you know, eight against one. I'm not proud of that, Sean. But when you're in that life, it's like you have to do it. You know, when they're doing that to your mates, you have to do it. You can't be the one who's going to say, no, I don't agree with this. What was the worst damage inflicted on your side? I would say, I would say there's an incident where they came, they came to a local pub and was drinking in a local pub. And it, the, the way it's situated is if you want to get from the London Apprentice pub back out to the London Road, which is the main bus route where you can get a bus to Hounslow or to Chiswick, you had to go through this long alleyway. And there was a little part of the alleyway where there was a little gate that goes into the park and it's like a little nature reserve where you can, and, and they had one bench in there. And we knew they were drinking in the London Apprentice. Um, and we, we sat in this little nature reserve on the bench, just drinking, smoking weed. And we knew they were gonna come and we knew there was about five guys, but they also had three girls. And the girls scrapping as well. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably the worst bit of, you know, for me, when I think about the worst damage that happened for me was witnessing what happened to the girls as well. You know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't nice. You know, the girl, yeah. the girls, it, they, you know, there was eight, nine men against five men and three girls and, and, you know, and the girls and the girls were fighting because it was their boyfriends who were getting beaten up. And we had people like, in our group who were, who'd been beaten up by them, who carried a lot of anger about that. And when the girlfriends started hitting them, the girlfriends got beaten up as well, you know? And it, and it, and it wasn't nice, you know, Sean, at the, at the end of that altercation, you look and, and you see eight bodies on the floor, unconscious, beaten up, three of them females. It's not a nice moment. It's, you know, I was, I'd done a lot of things wrong in my life, but I was never one of them people who would look at that and, and smile and be proud. I was never vicious. I certainly looked at that like, fucking hell, this is just, this is getting out of control. You know, and thankfully it was, I think after that, that was like one of the last altercations because both of the sort of ringleaders of, of the groups got nicked and went to prison and thankfully we we all sort of moved on, but it's... Um, what was the fates of Johnny and the guy who had his intestines hanging out? Uh, the guy who's got his intestines hanging out, I don't know. Um, Johnny is, is still in prison. He actually um, murdered someone about, I think about eight or nine years ago. Um, and it was pretty well documented on the on the news that um, he's still in prison now. I think he's on. I think he's on a. I think he's on a, a special ward for for for, for mental problems because um, he clearly displayed a, a lack of empathy for human life. And I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if he'll ever get out. I'm not. Sh I, I really don't know. I haven't followed the 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 progress of where he's at in his life. But that was the last I heard, is that he's, he's, he's still in prison. If it's documented, are you able to describe the nature of the murder? Um, I want to be careful what I say, because, you know, he's a dangerous man. Okay, and if, let's, let's not and, go and, there. And, and if he ever gets released, yeah, yeah. you know, I don't want him, uh, want, him, want him coming looking for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but people who, who, people who know me and know, and know, they'll know who I'm talking about. How hard was it to let go of your old friends? That was probably the most least explained but hardest part of reforming my life. Like no one sat me down and told me that. People are like, yeah, you need to look at yourself and you need to do this and you need to do that. No one says you need to let go of all them people. No one told me that. And I remember the, this, uh, this distinct moment, because I set up my, my business in the heart of my old community. Like literally, I got convicted of armed robbery on a shop that's like less than 50 meters from 
my office in, in Isleworth. So there was no hiding like how much I changed. Like everyone could see it. I, I opened this, this new business in the heart of my community, which a lot of people were like, mate, Maisie, you're an inspiration. But then there was a lot of people who were still deep in crime who were really hating on me, judgmental. And I remember the day I opened that shop, um, Oak Hill and Isleworth, and I had local MPs there, I had newspapers there. And across the road from my office, you got a pub called The Castle. And loads of my old mates were there outside drinking and, you know, shot in from there. Um, and these were the same mates, Sean. When I was in that pub drinking with them, they were like, we're fucking brothers, I'd die for you. But as soon as I changed and took a different route in my life, um, they were like, you've changed, mate. You've changed. You've got your head up your ass. Who do you think you are? Going, wearing a suit to work. Who the fuck do you think you are? And all this. I remember I had an altercation with one of them where he pulled me up. He was like, you're fucking brainwashed, mate. You're, you've been fucking brainwashed. And I was like, mate, I fucking needed my brain washed. <laughs> like, like. Would you be happy if I was still selling drugs and in and out of prison? You should be happy for me. Yeah, I'm not in the pub getting pissed with you, but I can't afford to do that. I do that and I just end up fighting everyone. And it was like this, this whole thing I went through on my own and there was no one to talk to about it. You know, like there was no one to turn to to say, fucking hell, almost all my old circle of friends have turned against me because I've chosen to take a different route in life. And I think that's something that isn't spoken about when, I mean, I speak about it to my, the men I work with in prisons, but certainly no one told me like, listen, when you change your life, Michael, all your friends are gonna fucking gossip and judge you. No one told me that. I thought I'm gonna change and everyone's gonna be giving me a round of applause. It, that's not me, been my experience. In fact, it's been the complete opposite, gossiping, judgment, collusion, and even try and bring you down. People have tried to bring me down, you know. Um, and it's like, y you grow up in these streets, in these communities thinking, these are your mates, they're loyal. It's bullshit. It's all fucking bullshit. They are not your mates. They're just people that are around you. They're your mates as long as it's serving them. They're not true mates. When I got back from prison to my hometown, people knew about my case and they were in the pubs, they were trying to shove cocaine up my nose and everything. I'm like, you know, I've been through all this, I don't want to go to her. I did go to alcohol for about a year. I thought to go out, to be happy, to be around people, you had to be on something, at a minimum, alcohol. So I was drinking Guinness and I was just, I was passing out and shit because my system was pure. I hadn't had any hooch or anything in prison. And, um, Moved down south, started hanging out with my body combat instructor, going out house parties with my stuff. And this guy's up to like two or three in the morning. He's not doing anything at all. He's just on a natural high of health and fitness. Doesn't <laughs> drink. He's the last person to go home from every party. I had an epiphany. I'm like, fucking hell, you can actually go out and enjoy yourself and not be on any substance, including alcohol. And that, made, that, that to me then gave me the strength to see someone else doing it to quit. Yeah, that's amazing. So you, you haven't drunk at all? Don't drink at all now, yeah. Mate, that's incredible. Yeah. I actually yeah. never knew that, Sean. Yeah, I never was a big drinker anyway. I went straight to chemicals when I was a teenager. Yeah. But um, I thought you had to be on something to be around people. Social anxiety, and I've had social anxiety. Yeah. And, um, but you just start, it's, it's hard, isn't it? You stop drinking. And people are laughing at you, like saying, what, you're gonna get a pint of milk? You're gonna get a pint of orange juice? And it's your mates. Yeah. They want you yeah. to be getting wasted with them. Yeah, cool. There's such a huge amount of pressure from your mates yeah, yeah. to party and just, just do these things. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to break through that, but now I just take the piss out of them. Yeah. Listen to them wasted and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just like funny to me. And I've got the strength now just to make jokes about the whole thing, but there's like a pain barrier you have to go through mm to detach from these things. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I, th I think you're, you're spot on in what you said about when you see someone else do it, it's much easier for you to do it. 
It's like you just see someone else model it. Oh, right, okay. That's he, possible. That, he fucking done it. Like, you can do it. Yeah. And I think that was the same for me. I was lucky. I had, you know, a few people when I got sober who were young enough to model what that looked like for me. That, oh, you can go out and you don't have to drink. Actually, it's so much better when you don't drink. Yeah. You've got much more money. You remember everything. And you get in less trouble. <laughs> you get your awareness. Yeah. If you know something's going to happen, you're aware. And um, the next day, you haven't got that fucking headache that prevents you from working. Yeah. So did you find? And sorry, I'm going to ask you a question now, Sean. So okay. did you find when you stopped drinking, you had a lot more energy to put into stuff like this, like this podcast? Man, when you're drinking. You like spike up in energy and enthusiasm and it, it goes into idiotic behavior. And you do have fun on that spectrum at some way. You do have some fun. But then the next day you pay that price. When you get rid of all that and you just start drinking and eating healthy, you just have natural energy all the time. Mm. And that's what my body combat instructor taught me because he's his fitness, you know, he's always working out, always eating healthy and shit, um, doesn't drink. and just got this natural human energy that we probably all have, but we, we hold ourselves back with the substances. Yeah. Nicking into that periodically, you, you, you fucking your immune system up. Mm, yeah, hundred percent, yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if that's part of, you know, why we do it. You know, maybe our greatness scares us. Freud said we've got a, a life wish and a death wish. Right. So we do things to destroy ourselves as well as a subconscious drive to destroy ourselves. And I, I know that's over, my death wish has overrode my life wish to the point where everything's just gone into complete and utter chaos at, at times. Yeah. yeah. Interesting, yeah. Because um, Mariana Williamson done, wrote this quote and saying, it's our deepest fear is our light, not our darkness. Yeah. You know, and I wonder if, you know, you pour alcohol and drugs on that. Oh, well now, now I don't have to step up and let my light shine because, yeah. you know, I'm hung over and God, life's so hard. But if I remove all that and I've got all this energy mm -hmm. to go and live the life I want, you know, now I have to face this fear of, oh, well, I'm OK when I'm down in the gutter. But put me on the stage and tell me to let my light shine. Fuck, and now I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> and your light is always shining. And some people want a piece of that. Mm. But other people, it's the Escobar quote, envy kills more people than cancer in Colombia. Mm. And those people try and trip you up. 100%, mate, yeah. Yeah, 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 100%. I mean, it's part of it. And I think, you know, when I, when I mentor people, you know, who are really serious about change, I, I, I do mentor men as well. And I say, this is something you need to be ready for. Judgment, gossiping, colluding from the people that are most closest to you, yeah? If someone is going to try and trip you up and tear you down, it's more likely to be someone really close than someone from a distance. And that's often a thing when you're on this journey of change that we overlook a little bit. We're like, often you get betrayed by someone who you think is a really good friend. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like. Yeah, that was what brought down my um, criminal organization was one of my closest uh, friends in America who sold us out. Blimey, there you go. It's a good example of it then. Yeah, yeah. All right, so. You said that you wanted to talk about the death of your dad. This is going to be a very brave thing to do because it was, it's very recent. Mm. Yeah, it was... The reason I wanted to talk about it, Sean, is because it's to paint a real picture of, of addiction for people. You know, my dad, um, he died um, on the 31st of July last year. And when he was younger... He used alcohol and some amphetamines. And over the years, that drug use progressed and alcohol use progressed um, to the point where he, he ended up using heroin and becoming addicted to heroin for a long period of time. You know, and um, he ended up living his final days in a shared house in um, Ashford, and he lived in a tiny room, like a single room in that house. And he lived off a diet of primarily Nutella on white bread and Cheerios. And he sat in that room with the curtains closed every day. Jesus. Every day. 
And I think for me, it was like, you imagine if you get on this, a lifetime of addiction, and if you imagine it like it's a train journey, and you get on the train when you're young, and it's, it's a bit of alcohol and coke, he was like the final stop of where a life of addiction takes you. And yeah, he, um, he died, he died, um, he died primarily, he, they said it was to do with all sorts of stuff internally, but he was just, a, he was a heroin addict, you know, and, um, and, and, and I share his story because he was a good man, you know, he was a good man. He was so good that he was, he'd be honest with me about it. You know, I'd say to him, times he'd get sick and I'd be like, Dad, come on. Do you think now's the time to knock the old heroin on the head? And he was like, son, I can't, I fucking love it. I just, I've done it for so long. I love just, you know, and, and, and just forgetting everything. And I was like, well, I can't, I can't argue with that. I can't argue with his honesty because I've also in my life wanted to forget and use drugs to do that. And so I respected him for his honesty, but deep down he was just someone who had a lot of pain. And you know, what addiction does, it takes. It takes money to begin with. And then it takes relationships, sometimes friendships first, and then relationships with someone you love. Your wife will say, I've fucking had enough of you. And then it takes jobs. And then it takes relationship with kids. And in the end, the last thing it comes back for is your life. It takes your life away. And for my dad, it was, it was a sad day at his funeral. You know, he's got, I thought I always had 13 brothers and sisters from him. There was actually 15. Um, 15 brothers and sisters who, many of them battle with addiction themselves. And um, it was a sad moment when, when we buried him because, you know, it could have been so different, you know, and he had me in his life. I was, I was one of the, the only kids who kept in contact with him throughout all of it. I just said to him, look, mate, I don't care if, you, if you're a heroin addict. I've got no investment in you getting clean. So you don't need to lie to me about it. I just love you anyway. But if you do get clean and sober, that'll be great. But I'm, I don't care if you do or you don't. Because I thought if I get too invested in that, I'm just going to get annoyed with him. So I always kept in contact with him. And it was this, it was this just a sad moment. You looked around the, the room at all these kids who grew up without a dad because addiction had taken this man away. You know, and... Um, I share that story because there's a lot of people who reached out to me after I'd done the first podcast with you who have battled with addiction. And we often think, you know, oh mate, I'm not that bad. But my dad is an example of what it looks like over a 58 year period. And at 58, he overdosed on too much heroin. And you know, scattered in between that was prison sentences my dad served for doing things silly things he done when he was off his head. And when you go to prisons, you meet people who done something stupid when they was off their head on drugs. So for me, it's about, I can use my dad's legacy to raise a little bit of awareness around addiction that, you know, addiction is a short-term solution, yeah, for a long-term problem. And the problem is really an, it, 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 if you're using drugs and alcohol, it's normally to numb some pain. And if you are carrying that pain, I'd invite you to reach out to me, get onto one of my workshops. You know, just, there are other ways to deal with that pain. You don't have to just use drink and drugs. I mean, Sean, you're a good example of it. You know, you're sober as well. You know, alcohol and drugs is literally just, you know, adding more fuel to the fire. You're trying to numb a pain that actually it doesn't go away unless you get it out and deal with it. Easier said than done. I imagine some people are thinking, especially people who are watching this, who perhaps have got young people who have been injecting drugs or people who've grown up in the family injecting drugs and they've like tried all the things they think would work possible. 
and they're just like at the wits end because mm -hmm. it really is the deep end and people who are shooting up drugs they will often hide it very cleverly mm -hmm. they will get money for it very sneakily they will lie and cover up their tracks and if you challenge them about their addiction they'll oh, i'm not addicted to drugs mm -hmm. because the addiction one of the things it does it, it scrambles your decision making processes and it tricks your mind into thinking you're not addicted you don't need help mm -hmm. i don't need any help i'm not addicted mm -hmm. why are these people f sp sp <laughs> the stress these people are putting on me is making me want to take drugs <laughs> i'm not addicted <laughs> so what do you say to those people, the family members who are perhaps struggling with this, they've got people in the family who are going through it. Mm. And I get, I get lots of messages from family members and there's a great fellowship called Al-Anon. Al-Anon is an organization set up to support family members. And primarily, the, there's, a, there's a thing in it and I can't remember because I went there years ago to help me process with the stuff from my dad and I found it hugely beneficial. And I think that the, the main philosophy they had there was the three, th they had a saying called the three C's. You can't control it. You can't cure it. And I can't remember the third one. It's been that long. You can't control it, can't cure it. I can't remember the third one. But if you Google the three C's, Alanon, get it up. And it's, it's basically, you can't control how long um, this, this using is going to go on for. You can't control it. You're powerless over that person. They need to hit their own rock bottom. And nothing you can say or do can fix it. Yeah? They send them to the biggest priced rehabs and everything. And No, you have to hit your own rock bottom. The only hope you've got as a family member is that that individual meets someone who's got a similar life experience that they're willing to listen to. That's the only thing that can penetrate a user. And even that doesn't always work. But I've seen breakthroughs where, because I was a heroin addict myself, and I've seen me sit in front of another heroin addict and they open up to me much more than they would open up to their own family. And when I share openly and honestly about my experience and where heroin addiction took me, to prison and trying to end my own life in a prison cell by hanging myself, you know, it gives them a stark insight into, right, that's how bad it can get, you know. And from there, a journey of recovery can begin. But a, another good organization and fellowship is Narcotics Anonymous, fantastic fellowship. Probably if you're looking at an organization who's got the highest success rate of recovered addicts in the world, it would be Narcotics Anonymous. Uh, there's also another fellowship called Cocaine Anonymous for anyone who's battling cocaine addiction, Alcoholics Anonymous. It's all the same principles based off the 12-step program, but they're, they're the best places to go. But unfortunately, if it's your family member, like it was with my dad, I was powerless over him, you know, and I couldn't, all my love couldn't change him. No matter how much love I give my dad, he was never going to get clean and sober for me. He had to do it for himself and he had to hit his own rock bottom. And unfortunately for him, his rock bottom killed him. You know, and, and that's the sadness about addiction. We never know where your rock bottom is. You know, some men hit their rock bottom when they're sentenced to life in prison for a crime they committed when they were off their head on drugs. It doesn't have to be that way. You know, you can change now. And for the families watching, I just, I, I send my deepest you know, condolences if you're going through this. I can't imagine how painful it, it must be. Well, I can in some sense, because I watched my dad kill himself. But um, if it's a child, I, I can't imagine my daughters ever going through it. It must be so sad. I know we went over it in the first podcast, but it was probably powerful at this moment to just tell people about that low moment you had when you were gonna hang yourself. Yeah. Do you wanna just- I'm happy to talk about that, yeah. So. I, I always used alcohol and drugs from a young age to help me deal with my pain. I was neglected, I was physically abused, my dad left. That was all my pain. I believed the universe wasn't a friendly place. And for me to survive in this world, I had to be an angry, unpredictable young man. The gateway drug I used to help me become that character was alcohol. Alcohol made me be more loud, aggressive, confident. 
but like with anything, who anyone who's got an addictive personality, alcohol became boring, and I wanted to try coke, and I wanted to try weed, and you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, by the age of seventeen, I started selling crack and heroin, and I was the worst drug dealer you could meet because I I was an addict, and addicts like drugs, and so I used to take all the drugs. And after I'd say, <clears throat> I don't know how, how long it was exactly, but I say I was using crack and heroin every single day for about three to four, five months, something like that. Every single day I'd get up and it was the first thing I'd do is, is, is use crack and heroin before anything else, before, before breakfast, before brushing my teeth, before anything, that was boom, the first thing you do. And, um, and luckily for me, I'm grateful for this, is that I eventually got arrested and put into prison. But when I arrived to prison, back, back then they had two ways to detox. They had a, they had a seven day detox, which is now banned now. They, don't, they, they, they banned that some time ago um, because there was a lot of negative health impacts or they had like a longer detox 14 days or longer i think they they give you loads of drugs and it's a long drawn out process and me being this young quite arrogant <clears throat> young man i was like just give me the seven day detox and it and it flushes the heroin and crack out of your body in a completely unnatural way that i wasn't prepared for physically mentally or emotionally it's it's completely inhumane um and yeah and I, rem I remember it started off uh, now bearing in mind i'm in a single cell in felt young offenders um on a wing in the, on the hospital wing where predominantly all the kids and i say kids because most of the ones on that wing were all under the age of 18 all young kids detoxing from heroin so you imagine the sounds you were hearing on that wing it was like each kid was being tortured in their cell it was horrific um, and, and it started off with just being as I was detoxing from the heroin I'd be really hot one minute to the point where I there's sweat on my forehead to then the next minute I'm freezing cold which was and, and I would go so cold that the sweat it would happen so quickly that the sweat would turn cold. I'd feel the cold sweat. It was, it was, it was a crazy, you know, like how quick it happened. Boiling hot to freezing cold. And then feeling really itchy. And then, you know, like unconsciously just scratching, scratching. And then looking down and realizing that you're bleeding. Not like, it's not pouring out, but there's blood there. You've, you've bought blood. And then, and then you're looking, thinking you're seeing something under your skin you're looking under your skin thinking is there something under is that the blood pulsating or can i see something under my skin and then visualize thinking you've saw something like a spider or an insect flying you're it's it's i can only describe it sean as i've had moments in my life where like when i saw my my daughter born where i just felt so much love in my heart it felt like heaven i was like god I, this feels so beautiful that moment when i was detoxing felt like hell i believe you can experience hell on earth and i experienced it in a prison cell aged 17 detoxing from heroin and you know all this tough guy image left really quickly and and i on my first prison sentence uh, a guy i was locked up with on the same wing committed suicide and so i knew how to commit suicide in a prison cell i never thought it was possible until that guy and it and it started as a fleeting thought if this gets much worse than this you know you're gonna have to wrap the bed sheet up and kill yourself and and you know it just it just went on and on and minutes felt like hours you know and um i slowly talked myself into ending my own life that's what that's how it went it slowly you know and some people call it your ego or the devil or whatever but there was a voice saying 
just fucking kill yourself, mate. Just, you can't take this, mate. And you're just like the men who went before you in your family history anyway. So just fucking end it. Just fucking end it. You can end it now. Just end it. Boom. And I, fight, I fought with his voice for a long time. And, and then it just got to the point where I just thought, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it. That's where, how the voice started saying, just try it. You, you, look at the mesh you're in. You're probably going to get it wrong anyway. And so I wrapped the bed sheets up. And you imagine how you roll up a Rizla. That's how you roll the bed sheet up. And you roll it up, made a few tears here and there, and you end up with a rope. You end up with a long bit of thing that ends up working, and you wrap one around the bars, yank it really tight. And then the other end, you make a noose. And I was convinced, Sean, this isn't gonna work. I was like, I'm such a mess. I'm probably gonna fuck this up. It's probably gonna take me two or three attempts to get, really nail this, get this perfect. And I put it around my neck and I was laying on the bed and I just rolled off my bed. And, and it went, it yanked me so hard, my neck so hard that I went up. I remember hearing the cracking, like, you know, you got the little bones in your neck that crack. I remember it going <laughs> And as brave, and as confident as I was, and as determined as I was to end my own life, the first thing I'd done was try to get it off. It's the first thing you do, is to try and, try. you don't want to die. But it was so tight, I just sort of, you know, I fought for a bit, and then, you know, you slowly, slowly, just make peace with that this is it. And in their moments, I thought of my mum. I thought of, there's a character in the book called Mary who, who wasn't any relation of mine. She was just a lovely Irish woman in my community who wanted to help me. And, and the, biggest, the biggest thought I had was, I'm sorry. I thought of my mum and I was just like, I'm sorry. I, I really wanted to be better than, than my dad and I, and I couldn't be. And that was it, and I, and I passed out. And, and the next thing I remember, I was, laying on, I was laying on the bed. I just remember laying down, and, and there was like a bright light. I could see it, you know, above me. And I had this moment where I, I was like, am I dead? And what it was, the prison guard, because you're on a hospital and everyone's detoxing from heroin, and this was like in the middle of the night, and every, I don't know, two, three hours, the prison guard has to just go round to every cell. And each cell has got a little flap on the front of the door. And he just will open the flap on the door, just check you're either sleeping or you're alive, and then close the flap. And it was just at that moment, I was, I think, I was on the ground floor <clears throat> on the right hand side of the wing, three cells in. If that prison guard had a started on the left hand side of the wing or if he had a started on the top floor I would have been dead but he started on the ground floor he went checked the first recess checked mine I was unconscious hanging and he came in cut me down and was doing CPR on me on on the on my bed in the in the cell so when I was coming to and I could see the light he the light was turned on on the cell See, on the cell ceiling, in the, it was a, the light on the ceiling. And I could hear him and another officer sort of, argue, they weren't arguing, but they were like, oh, saying, when did he last check him, all this sort of stuff. And, um, and they lifted me. One carried my, 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 me by the wrist and one carried me by my ankles. And they took me down the other end of the wing and they have one cell that is a padded cell and that you can't kill yourself in this cell. And, um, and, the, and they walked me in and just put me on the floor and walked out. And I, I curled up in the fetal position, Sean, and I just cried for my mum. I just cried at, you know, that so much pain, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd run from that pain so, 
done so many things to get away from that pain. And in that moment, I had to feel that pain in all its intensity. You know, the pain of the abuse, the neglect, my dad not being there, my mum being an alcoholic, being physically abused, being beaten. Uh, you know, it was a horrific moment, but also in that was a bit of a rebirth as well. Because for all my life, I'd always convinced myself I was this tough guy. And clearly in that moment, I wasn't a tough guy. Was that the moment where your life went in a new direction from? It definitely gave me a new image of myself. Because I was so invested in this idea that I was tough. That I was, I was a fighter, I was a tough guy. And in that moment, I knew without a doubt, I was just a scared little boy who wanted his mum. I was in the fetal position in a padded cell crying for my mum. And you know, it's, um, it's funny how things work, you know, and this is why I think, you know, I'm not religious, but I do believe in, in, in a God or a higher power because at exactly that same time, my mum had joined AA and got sober, literally in the same period, the same seven day period. And so, you know, the prison obviously called my mum because I was still a, still a child technically and said, your, your son, you know, tried to kill himself. He was, thankfully he didn't succeed. We caught him just in time, um, but you need to come and see him. And so I went out to the visiting room in Feltman Offenders, which is normally a place where you get to strut your stuff and show people how tough you are, show the outside world, look mate, this place ain't phasing me. And that's how I often would strut out. I'd have a bit of a walk and I'd be like, you're right, bruv, yeah, well, you know, I can act in like Charlie Big Bollocks. <laughs> and, um, and this time I walked out different, Sean. I was broken. You know, my neck was, I had bruises all around my neck. Um, and I just walked out with my head down, completely emotionally broken. And I, and I sat in front of my mum and, and, and I wasn't sure what my mum my would say. I wasn't sure if she was still drinking. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't sure where my mum was at in her life. And, um, and she held my hand and she said, Michael, I, I just want you to know, I've realised I've been an alcoholic all these years and um, I've decided I want to get sober and I've joined AA. And I just burst into tears. And I just hugged my mum and, and, and I cried, Sean, but I cried with an intensity that I'd never cried like before in front of the whole visiting room. Years and years of suppressed I'd suppressed this sadness, this pain, and it came out hugging my mum, you know, and in that moment, all, all I wanted all my life was just one, one sober parent to just be there. And I had it when I needed it the most, when I'd just come that close to death. And, um, and that was a moment for me when I, when I, when, when you finish the visiting room, you will go back to a holding cell and where all other inmates are loud and they're being, and I sat there just still crying and, and they're sort of looking at me, you know, sort of mocking me a little bit. Um, but I knew, I knew then I was like, I'm not this tough guy that I've been, I, that I thought I was, I'm not. Although I, I had this great mask, I could present this really strong, angry man Deep down I weren't. Deep down I was a sad, scared boy that had a lot of stuff that needed to be worked on. And you know, I never got sober then, Sean, but that was the beginning of starting to look at myself a bit differently. You know, that maybe, maybe you're not this, this guy that you think you are. Such a powerful story. Did you ever think about or attempt suicide after that? I did, mate, yeah. Yeah, so, one of the things that, you know, I struggled with growing up was committing, commitment, you know, in a relationship to another woman, you know, and I'm not blaming my father for that, but my father's uh, 
let's say, as a role model, didn't model it very well. I've got 15 brothers and sisters from nine different women. When things got hard, my dad just left and got another woman pregnant. So sort of the blueprint handed down to me was when things get tough, mate, just sack her off and get, get another woman pregnant. And subconsciously, that's what I was, I'd done, you know, and I, I met a, a, a girl called Haley. I write, write about her in the book. And there's a bit more to that story of why, why me and her ended, which I couldn't put in the book for legal reasons. But, um, but yeah, she was a good girl when, when I met her and, and I was unfaithful to her. And I, I, had this, I had this moment where I was living at her mum and dad's house and I'd actually got a job. It's like my first job. It was a big deal for me. I'd never had a job. So I had a job, I was living at her house, but I cheated on her like ages ago, a year, two years ago. And suddenly, just as I was doing well, it all came out. Someone told her, Michael cheated on you all these years ago. Um, and she was like fuming. Her mum and dad kicked me out of the house and I was homeless. I was homeless. I just I felt like I was getting on in life and, and it was like, what, what are you gonna do? It was like I had nowhere to live. I didn't have enough money to rent somewhere. And the only solution my mind come up with was to go and commit a crime, to go back to prison. Because I was like, at least at prison, you got a bed and three meals a day. And so I toyed with what crime I could commit so I could just get the least sentence possible. And then I played it through all the things that happened to me in prison, which you know, you know about. Um, and I was like, I can't, I can't go back to that place. And so I just, you know, there was a party on that night. And so I went, I thought, I'm just gonna go to the party, get pissed. And again, this is where alcohol and addiction comes in. Cause I drank, I used drugs, which poured more fuel on the fire. That little voice in my head just was attacking me. You're shit. You're just like, oh, you're just like your father. You may as well just kill yourself, mate. You're no good. You're shit. You know, you're a scumbag. You cheated on the only woman that loved you. This is all in my ear as I'm drinking. And I just stood, got up like a zombie in this party. And this, I was in a party full of friends and I felt completely alone. And I just got up like a zombie and I walked to the kitchen and there was, there was a, this, it was like a housewarming party. This girl had just bought this house, not bought this, just moved into this house. And she'd bought this new knife set. You know, when you have knives in a bit of wood, it's like a block, knife block. So these knives were brand new. Like I didn't, I didn't know that. And I just walked out like a zombie out to the kitchen, pulled the knife out and just went like that. Not knowing it was a brand new knife, it completely opened up this whole piece of my arm. And I, I was completely hammered. So I didn't even really feel it. And I just stood there and eventually just passed out. And um, I came to in the ambulance and um, the ambulance people were like, you know, sort of, they couldn't stitch it there, but they put a, a, this thing on it and wrapped it up. They stopped the bleeding and, and said like, look, you, now you're conscious, we need to take you to the hospital. But the thing is with me, once I'd had a drink, Sean, I couldn't stop and I'd had a drink and, um, I said to the ambulance people, I'm not going to the hospital. And they couldn't believe it. They was like, you've got a wound that needs a load of stitches. You've done internal nerve damage. You know, you're lucky you didn't bleed to death. If you don't go to the hospital, you're putting your life at risk. And I was just like, I'm not going. So I got out of the hospital and I went back into the house. This ambulance was parked outside the house where the party was. Everyone had gone home because they were like, this is horrific. There was blood everywhere. And the poor girl whose house it was, you know, had to put up with me until I was ready to leave. I mean, I, I was one of them annoying drunks who wouldn't go home, you know? And she was like, I want you to, I want you to leave. And I was like, I'm not, I've got nowhere to go and I'm not going. So, you know, and I just stayed at the party drinking and drinking and, you know, time went on and 
eventually, you know, someone got you know got in contact with my mum, and my my mum turned up at this house and was like, "For Christ's sake, Michael, what have you done?" And again, I had another moment where I just cried. Um, and I went to the hospital, and they stitched me up, and it was it was another moment of like. Drinking and drugs are not my friend, you know? They really just want me dead, you know? And I wish that was the moment I got sober, but even that wasn't enough to get me sober. And, and that's what I mean about having a family member addicted to drink and drugs. Like, you really do have to hit your own rock bottom. And for me, that just wasn't my rock bottom. It was one of many rock bottoms I had to have before I was finally like, enough's enough. What was the final one? The final one was on the 14th, I think it was the 14th or the 13th of December, 2007. And it was a Christmas party. I had a job at this time and I'd li I was living in Ireland, Northern Ireland. And um, I'd moved to Northern Ireland because I wanted to get away from London and try and have a fresh start um, and also fix my alcohol problem. You know, of all places to fix an alcohol problem, Ireland seems like a good choice, right? <laughs> I know. This is the insanity of the addict mind. But anyway, it did actually work in the end because I had no one around me to pick up the pieces when I fell. And uh, I had this really good job and it was really close to Christmas. And um, I went to the Christmas party and, you know, I always suffered a bit with paranoia. You know, I think years and years of taking drugs, smoking lots of cannabis. And, you know, I was about three months sober. So I joined AA and I was about three months sober, but the paranoia and stuff hadn't left me. I hadn't learned any emotional tools to help me deal with difficult conversations. And so I suspected that lots of people judged me in the office as being a, a scumbag you know, because of my past or whatever. And the Christmas party came and everyone was drinking and, you know, this old voice started again. Oh, mate, this is so boring. You know, you ain't drank for three months, mate. Maybe you should just have one. Just take the edge off. Just take the edge off. Just might alleviate some of this paranoia, this social anxiety you're feeling. It might just get rid of it a little bit. Just just a little, a little couple of pints. And the, the, the sober part of my brain was going, you know what will happen, mate. You, you know what's going to happen. You have one, you're going to have loads more. And then the other voice was like, no, it'll be different. It'll be different. Just, tr mate, you've been sober three months, man. Trust yourself. And eventually I caved in and I drank. And, um, and, it, and very quickly it turned into a, a sl you know, me firing insults at some of the female staff. Then a man jumped up who worked for the company and then we got into an argument. And the MD of, of the company who, who was a very successful businessman, he won like businessman of the year in Ireland that year, I think. He was on the front of all these magazines. Lovely bloke. He pulled me to one side. He said, listen, calm yourself down. I'm gonna go to another little private bar and, I'm, and we'll have a few little brandies, calm you down a bit. Now he didn't clearly, he clearly didn't know I was an alcoholic, right? <laughs> or had an addictive personality. Because giving me brandy was literally just pouring fuel onto the fire. And um, towards the end of my drinking, I used to have blackouts. Blackouts for me are just a little moment of the night. Could be 10, 15, 20 minutes where I just can't remember what happened. And in between having the brandy and arriving outside laying on the floor with him in a in a chokehold trying to choke him out like ufc style this md who was a lovely guy i couldn't remember how i'd got from drinking brandy to being on the floor in the car park outside choking him out and i was choking him out with <clears throat> all the staff around screaming uh get off him get you're gonna fucking kill him get off him and me panicking like Fucking hell, what, is, what am I doing? I dropped him and, and proceeded to blame them for what I was doing. This wouldn't happen if it wasn't for you, etc., etc. And um, I carried on drinking that night into oblivion to the point where I could almost not even remember having him in a headlock. Like it might have just been a dream. 
<laughs> yeah, right? And I went to bed and, you know, I woke up the next day and I went into the office on the Monday. And, um, you know, I remember walking in the office and the receptionist going, <gasps> as I walked in, and me thinking, fucking, what the fuck is that about? I was thinking, shit, man, what did, was it that bad on, on, I can't remember if it was a Friday night or a Saturday night when the Christmas party was, but I was thinking, shit, was it that, I must have really fucked up. And all the staff couldn't believe I was there, and then the, M, the MD of the company was there, and he said, Michael, you got a minute? He pulled me in, and he, he was a lovely guy, and he said to me, listen, you can't remember anything from the Christmas party, can you? And I said, mate, oh, I sort of remember I was a bit of an it. I shouldn't drink. In all honesty, I shouldn't drink, mate. And he was like, and he told me what, what had happened. But he also said to me, Michael, you, you know, you got great potential. You could really do some, you, you, you're a good guy, but you need to really sort that drinking out. He's like, you're a different person when you've had a drink. And I remember I, I got sacked. I went home, it was right before Christmas. And, um, and that was like the final straw for me. It was, it was a culmination of, you think I was 25 then, 25 years and I just was always scraping along the bottom of life, never really doing much. And it was that final straw where I was like, I fucking had enough of this shit. I fucking had it. I'm not doing it anymore. And that was my rock bottom, you know, and touch wood, I've never had a drink since, you know, I've been, that's my sobriety date. My sobriety date is 15th of December, 2007. I've never had a drink or drug since that date. And for me, it was that moment of, I'm going to do whatever it takes now to change myself as a person. So I don't ever have to use alcohol and drugs again. And what I'd done was a 12 step program developed by Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went to AA meetings and I just threw myself into this new way of life. And for me, the biggest thing about the 12 step program is about you just holding a mirror up in front of yourself. And you know, stop blaming everyone else, look in the mirror, get accountable for your own life, stop blaming everyone, take responsibility. And when I'd done that, as painful as it was, Sean, it was so empowering because it was like, if the, power, if the problem was everyone else, it was always something outside of me, I could never fix it. I can't control everything else. But if the problem is me, at least I've got some power over me. I can change me. And it was like, oh, suddenly, wow, so I've got some power over this. I can change this situation. And that's when it switched. It was like, okay, what happened to me in my childhood wasn't okay. Um, it's not okay. It was, it was wrong. But I'm not going to let that uh, dictate the course of my life anymore, you know, and I'm going to change and become a better person. And so for me, yeah, the, the rock bottom wasn't <laughs> as bad as a suicide attempt, Sean, but it was, it was getting to this point where I had had enough, you know, and for me, it took a lot of beating. To, to get me to there. But so the next time you went in the bar then, after making that decision, what happened? Well, mate, I didn't go in a bar for, I reckon it must be the first two years of my sobriety because I knew how edgy that would be for me, you know. Were there any other temptations during that two years? There was, mate, yeah, there was, and this is where we, we, don't, we don't touch on it too much in the book because of, you know, legal reasons, but there was, there was in my relationship with my partner, Hayley, at the time, and she continued to, to drink and, you know, do live that lifestyle, shall we say. Um, and, and it was hard for me, you know, because I was like, I just, I can't just have drinks and do a bit of whatever, and live a normal life. It, it's all or nothing for me. And it, it was this tough moment where you suddenly realise if I want to get sober, I've got to end this relationship with this person who I love. Mm, how hard was that? It was, I would say, probably 
emotionally one of the hardest things I've done in my whole sobriety, you know, because, you know, I had to battle with this part of me that felt like she was always there for me when I was at my worst. So I should always be there for her. But then there was another part of me that was like, I know for me, I'm playing with life or death here, you know? And if I wanna live a life that isn't where I'm gonna kill someone or kill myself, I, that has to go. And how old were you at that point? Uh, me and Haley broke up when I was about 27, about two, two years sober. And, um, and I think the hardest, the hardest part of that, when it ended, she just cut all contact. We've never spoke ever, you know, and I've reached out through different ways and, and, and you know, made my amends for how I was because I was a shit boyfriend and she was an angel for putting up with me. Um, but there's been no contact there. And I think, I think, you know, when you do the 12 step program and you go through this process of making amends, to people, clearing up the wreckage of your past and saying sorry for all the sh things you've done wrong. You don't always get the pat on the back and people accept your apology. Some people tell you to piss off and some people never respond. And, and Haley's in that category of, of, of some, one of them people who just, you, you, never, you never hear from. You know, that, Perhaps it's too painful for us still? I think so, I think so and you know, I, w I genuinely wish her well in her life. She, she's a good girl and she played an instrumental part in me getting sober, but there is a sentimental part of me, Sean, that would, would love to sit with her, have a coffee and, and laugh about all of it, you know? Just say, you know, because we, we were kids. We, we were kids who, who were just trying the best with what we had, you know? So what about other addictions then? Russell Brand talks about how he went from drugs to sex to blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Well, mate, this is, you know, I think I was sold this dream, Sean. Get sober, mate. Your life will change. You're going to be live this great life, right? And, mate, I just found new, creative, less destructive ways to fill that hole in my soul. You know what I mean? It was like, I'm going to do this. It's less destructive, but it's still a bit of an addiction. <laughs> Can you give us some examples? Yeah, I think... You know, one of, one of the big ones for me was sex, you know, and it, and, and it wasn't even the, the act of having sexual intercourse with, with, with a woman. It was more so the chase <laughs> as well of like, you know, feeling like I'm good enough to attract the attention of a woman because I don't believe that I'm good enough myself so I need that validation from you for me to believe there must be something good with you, Michael. Look at all these women who want you. And that was like a real empty process to go through, Sean. I had this real rock bottom around it where I was engaging with lots of women and thank God I got in my relationship with my wife when I did, because nowadays with all the social dating apps, I would have been a nightmare. <laughs> but, but I remember there, there was one moment where I'd had, I, I had a, I'd had a meet up with, with, with a girl and it was about 2 a.m. and I was outside my home about to go in and I got my phone out and I'm flicking through my phone looking for other numbers I could text. And I had this moment of deja vu, like, I've been here before. When have I been here before? And I remembered in my drinking and using, when you get to 2, 3 a.m. and you're looking for a dealer that's still awake. And then you're flicking through your phone thinking, what dealer will still be awake now that I can buy some coke off? And I was, and it was this moment of like, you've just swapped that cocaine for this sex or attraction thing. And it was like, God, another thing I've got to give up, <laughs> you know? And, I, and, and in the beauty of that, Sean, you go, well, why? Why are you doing this? Why do you feel the need for that dopamine hit from women? And it was like, cause I'd, after lots of therapy, I come to understand because I don't feel good enough. 
sometimes I look in the mirror and I just see the old heroin addict looking back at me. And I see the old convict who spent all them years in prison. And I just feel I'm still that little scumbag in a lot of ways. And if I get enough attention from females, it makes me feel like, well, maybe I'm not. But the truth is what I need is to give that to myself. Can I learn to treat myself like someone that I love? So visualize someone you love and how would you treat them? You'd look after them, you'd give them good food, give them water, give them exercise, give them all the good things to make them happy. Okay, treat yourself like that. And that is what was hard because I had a mum who, and, and dad, who knew nothing about self-love. They used alcohol and drugs to deal with their pain, you know? And I had to somehow learn, how do I show myself love? Even though on some level I feel like I don't deserve any. And it was through, you know, pain that forced me to go, you know, okay, I'm gonna start living a healthier lifestyle. And then that become another addiction, you know? Before we go there, and I don't want to get you in trouble with your wife. Yeah, sure. So you've met your wife. You've still got all these numbers in your phone. How do you psychologically detach? Yeah, so for me, that, that journey, it sort of it, it moved on a little bit. I was less sort of, it wasn't that, I didn't have that much power over me by the time I'd met Sasha. You know, I'd met Sasha when I was, geez, five, six years sober, I think. So it moved on a bit, it evolved, I had a bit more self-knowledge. I had less numbers on my phone like that. But there was the odd text that would randomly pop in the first six months to a year. Sexy photo, et cetera. Yeah, it was, it was stuff like that. But I had a Facebook account and on Facebook it was pictures of me and Sasha. And sort of news travels and so anyway. But doesn't that sometimes make women, you've got the stamp of approval now, they want to take you from that woman. I certainly had, I certainly have had a lot of that <laughs> over the years, even when the book came out. Crikey, when the book got released, I suddenly had an influx of uh, naked pictures sent to me on Instagram. <laughs> I was like, what? You send, you just send these with no conversation now. I was like, wow, the world has moved on. I thought you at least had to have a bit of chat before, before, you know. I was just men doing that with dick pics. <laughs> I, mate, I was just like, wow. You know, and uh, it's just a case, you know, for me, unfortunately, if, if I get anything like that, I just block you, you know, because for me, it's, it's just, um, it's, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm married and I don't even need to be having a conversation with you about, please don't send that to me. You know, I just need to just go, Phew. just block. But um, there certainly was moments in, in, in the beginning when I first met Sasha and you'd get messages like that and that old voice would kick in oh mate you you can't settle down yet you still got a few years in the old dog yet come on <laughs> and and it and, it, and i'm lucky that i i burnt myself out with that i'm lucky because in burning yourself out of it you realize there's no joy in meaningless sex there's no joy there's no joy in that you know the joy is found in having a having a vulnerable intimate relationship with another human being and you can only do that when you spend enough time with that human being and really get to know them at a vulnerable level and that's what i done with, with with sasha was let her see all of me like all my fears all my insecurities like you know all of me you know and, it, and if she, and if she sees all of me and she still loves me then great she loves you for all of you not just the little bits you decide to give her and that in itself was an art, Sean, that I had to learn, you know, because when things were really beautiful with me and my wife, I had moments where I just wanted to fuck it all up, you know, because on some level, I still believe you don't deserve this. And I also believe you're going to fuck this up anyway, Michael, because look, your dad did 15 kids, nine different women. What makes you think you're so different, mate? And that's the voice I have to fight with you know it's i think there's like a verse in the bible or something it says the father's sins will be passed down to the son and i believe that's what that voice is it's like i'm battling the blueprint handed down to me by my father 
and it's like you know I have to just remind myself I'm I'm not my dad and and I've I've done a lot of things very differently um but there is a part of that that I think will always be with me till the day I die you know so did fitness and health become an addiction then and is it could you say that that's a positive activity that you got addicted to because as my therapist said look if you give something up, you've got to put something in its place. You was, it's all energy. You was addicted to negative things. Put positive things in the place. So for me, it became like karate and fitness classes and working out and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. There was a point where I was doing three hours a day okay. at the gym mm -hmm. about five plus years ago. Um, similar st parallels with you? or 100%. Yeah. And I think there's a line there, isn't there? It's like, it, it's a... Uh, if it becomes an unhealthy habit, and that's where mine drifted into, you know, like it started off with like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do exercise, but then I, I I'm an addict, and I look at myself in the mirror and go, oh, a little bit there, little, oh, all right, so how am I gonna get rid of that? Google it, okay, now I'm on this new diet, and now I'm eating all these new foods, and I'm and I'm this, and, and now, well, if you train a little bit more, you'll get there quicker. Okay, great, all right, so no, no carbs, more training, boom. And then you eventually get to this point, and then you notice another point, you're like, oh, oh, blah. And, it, and it's like this never-ending thing of, of, of being happy with how you look. And I think fitness and exercise definitely became an addiction for me, and for me, life is all about balance, you know, and so just get, I have to get it in balance in like, you know, I'm allowed to eat carbs, I'm allowed to eat pudding <laughs> and I'm going to exercise a certain amount of times a week. And if I feel this need to do it all the time, then I need to really sit with myself and ask myself, what is it am I running from here? You know, my therapist always made a good point over the years. Um, be, don't be a human doing be a human being. So less doing, more being. So every now and again, you need to stop, stop doing so much and just sit like with your feelings. What are you feeling? And you know, I'm good at doing, doing, doing. I'm good at that. Tell me to slow down and check in with how I feel. Oh, fucking hell, Jesus Christ, you know. I think most people are just racing through life. And it took a SWAT team to make me sit down and have an introspection. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, mate, yeah. I think it's forced on prisoners, isn't it, when they get arrested all that time, all of a sudden. Yeah. Then you start to replay your life. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. With no help, though, that's the other thing. You know, you need that professional help there. Yeah. You know, not necessarily from a therapist, but someone who's walked that path before you. But I completely agree, mate. You know, that's, that's what it's about, slowing down and just really checking out what am I running from? Why, why am I keeping myself so busy? What is it that I don't want to feel? Yeah. You know, and um, nine times out of 10 for me, it's grief. It's sadness. Grief, sadness, same thing. It's sadness. You know, sadness around everything I went through, you know. If I were to read this story as someone else's life, I'd be like, God, it's so, such a sad story. That is my story. And I, ha and I still have to sit with a grief around that, you know, of, of, of the boy who experienced too much at a young age, you know? So you've got how many siblings? <laughs> I've got 15. What's your relationship with them like? Uh, I'll be honest with you, mate, not great. Mm. A lot of them are stuck in, in addiction and in and out of prison. Um, some of them aren't. Um, but it's difficult for me, you know, because you can't, you can't help everyone, you know, and, uh, I definitely have this thing in me where I could care about them getting sober more than they care about getting sober. And that's where it becomes a bit codependent and a bit dangerous for me. And so I have to have healthy boundaries in place there. You know, that like, look, you know, you want my advice on, on how to get sober and change your life? You can call me up anytime, but I'm not gonna be lending you money. I'm not gonna be bailing you out. I'm not gonna be giving you references, you know, like, um, and, and that's where I'm at with it. You know, it's, it's a sad 
reality that you've got 15 children who grew up without no dad and the dad who was there was a was an active addict and a lot of them have gone down that path not all of them but i would say most of them it's really sad yeah yeah i mean we thought it was 13 and then when his when he was at his funeral a, a brother popped up i got a brother called vince i was like oh my god you could see this i was like oh my god i've got a brother you know it's um it's one of their moments you know you just it's just crazy man so we're getting near the end of this now then is there anything you'd like to say in conclusion to the people watching it i don't know if you've read any of the comments on the previous one that you did yeah there's there, lots of great comments on there lovely comments you know and um i think you know it's just it, it's great to know that people support stories like mine you know it gives me faith in 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 the world and and humanity that you know yeah you can have a really you know terrible upbringing and make loads of mistakes but as long as you are trying as long as you're a better man and you're trying to help others be a better man that's what people will remember you for they'll remember you for the man you are today not for the man you used to be and so um I'm just grateful. I'm, I'm so grateful for all the support and everyone who's reached out to me from, from the first episode I'd done with you, Sean. And, and grateful for you, Sean. You know, you're giving men like me a platform to share this, which is opening doors and changing lives. So, you know, just grateful for that, mate. Thank you. You're welcome. So many people helped me, you know, when I got out of prison. And um, I've always had it as a mission to people who've been in prison to get the stories on there like these. Fucking celebrities are boring as fuck, really, <laughs> compared to the lives people like, like you've had. Um, all right, then. So please let us know what you thought about this podcast today in the comments section. If you want to see the first episode, the link's down there, as are all of Michael's socials. If you want to go to his um, retreats and therapy stuff. So let me just cl clarify that for the people then. So say someone's got addiction issues, yep. they could just contact you. Are, yep. they, do they, are these around the country or they'd have to come to a certain part of the country? What, what's the cost involved, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I run different workshops. Yeah. If you've got, if you have got some, one of them sort of issues and you want to come and attend one of our workshops, we run them on my land in Devon. I've got 10 acres of land in Devon. I run workshops on the land and we've got a residential space as well where we run, run workshops there as well. So you can check for more information on the website, uh, www.thecipproject.com. You can also follow us on Instagram, just at the CIP project um, and, and get on board. Um, if you're interested in me running sort of workshops in schools, colleges or prisons, again, just reach out to me on social media or on the website. Um, these things aren't expensive. They're, it's a non-profit organization I set up I put a lot of my own money into this to give this stuff at affordable prices to people who really need it. You know, this isn't um, a money-making scheme. You'll know when you look at the, the, the price, it's, it's, it's not a lot of money. I think the, the next workshop in December for a full residential weekend, all the accommodation, a full packed weekend, we have an on-site chef. It can't, I think it's 280 quid for the full weekend. You know, so it's it's not a lot of money for when you factor in the food. We got to hire the whole this massive like you know retreat centre. Compared to the amount of people spend on these like, really expensive rehabs, and they they don't even do anything for them. Mate, yeah, well, the average self development workshop weekend is is about eight hundred quid. So we're you know we're way below that, and and that's because we're not in it for money. You know. So those workshops then are they open to people of a certain age and male and female? They're unfortunately not female at the moment, but the, the female side of it we're working on and we've got some really strong women that are going to build this. Um, but on the, at the moment, it's just male only. I, I run, me and myself and another few guys run all the male workshops, but we're working on a team of females to run these female workshops that are going to just be incredibly powerful. Again, women who've had lived experience, real life experience, and are now living the, the life they want. So um, it's the same blueprint that we use, you know, for my workshop. It's just going to be women running it, that's all. So you've got to be 18 to come to one of these workshops? You haven't got to be 18, actually. We ran the first one last time with uh, two 17-year-olds on it. You can see their, their details on our website. Um, one of them came with their father, 
and had a, a transformational experience they had. I mean, it's incredible watching father and son do this work together. And, um, and the workshop in December, we got four 17 year olds come in, yeah. So, you know, it's good. And, and the young guys, you know, get them in young, make the change young, and then there's less, less years to fuck things up, you know. There's a couple of guys on there. I mean, I won't mention any names, but look on the website and find these guys. You know, uh, one's called Kez, another one, another one called Halim. Incredible young lads. You know, they're gonna really go out in the world and make some real difference. You know, making that change so young. Honestly, Sean, it's it gives me hope in the future when I look at young lads like that. You know. If you would like to check out Michael's book, Young Offender, it's available worldwide on Amazon. And are you leaving these here for us to give the... You can send, give send these them. away. Anyone who, you know, wants a copy of this book, Sean, I'll leave you to choose. Who All right, is. so what we'll do is um, the comments, there's five copies here. The comments below this video that get the most likes, the top five comments, each one of them will get one of these books mailed to them. So let us know down there, you know, give us some um, good comments that is going to get some traction with the likes. I'll sign each one as well, so you'll have a signed copy. Great. So other than that then, huge thank you to all the new subscribers. Subscription logo is in the bottom right-hand corner. Huge thank you to people who have donated, PayPal, Patreon, just giving, subscribe, star, all the links are down there. So we can produce these in, at this quality in the studio. And um, huge thank you to the trolls as well for giving us so many views lately <laughs> and sending everything to record highs. We love you, trolls. <laughs> Brilliant, man. Nice one, mate. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Cheers, buddy. Powerful stuff. <laughs>